Hello, everybody. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the cover cropping for drought resilience workshop hosted by the Madera Chowchilla East Stanislaw and East Merced RCDs. We're excited to have you with us today and hope you learned some resourceful information surrounding cover crops and how they tie into water conservation. Uh, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So anytime during the presentation, please type any questions you may have for our presenters in the chat, which is below um, on your Zoom screen, and we will be sure to have them answered at the end of the presentation. And again, also, if you will be receiving CCA or DPR credits, please be sure to right click on your name and rename yourself to include both your first and last name so we can be sure you receive your credits. Um, so our first presenter is Trina and she is the, I'm just going to give a bio on all of our presenters today. She is the executive director for the East Stanislaw RCD and she will be covering um, funding and programs for IPM, cover crops and best management practices. And we have Paul Lum with American Farmland Trust. He is the agricultural specialist for the American Farmland Trust California region. Before joining AFT, Paul worked as the irrigation specialist for Solano Irrigation District. He serves on the board of the Solano Resource Conservation District and is the past president of the Solano County Farm Bureau. Paul graduated from the University of California Davis with a degree in plant science and agronomy and is a second generation farmer near Vacaville growing primarily almonds. And our next presenter is, um, so Anna, or Anna. Anna Gomez is currently a PhD student at Stanford University as part of the Soils and Environmental Biochemistry Research Group. Anna studies carbon and nitrogen cycling in addition to improving soil water holding capacity on California farmland. She has a master's degree in environmental studies and sustainability science from Lund University in Sweden, where she worked with farmers in the Netherlands to understand their adoption of soil greenhouse gas mitigation practices. And a bachelor's degree from UC Davis, where she originally met and worked with Jeff to study the soil water impact of winter cover crops with reduced disturbance tillage. And we have Jeff Mitchell, who is a professor and cooperative extension cropping system specialist in the Department of Plant Science, Sciences Science at the University of California, Davis. He came through UC Davis for both his master's and PhD degrees. He has had the good fortune to work with California's Conservation Agriculture Systems Innovation Center, which currently has over 2,200 university farmer natural resource conservation service, public agency, and private industry members and affiliates. Before beginning his graduate studies, he was a teacher and served as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana in Southern Africa. He also teaches courses on agronomic and vegetable crop systems at the University of California, Davis. And our next presenter we have was, is Tom Johnson. He is the agronomist for Camprath Seed in Manteca. Camprath Seed specializes in cover crop seed and applications. Uh, he has been developing cover crop solutions for California cropping systems for 20 plus years and is still learning something new every day. Cover cropping is an art and a science. And the next presenter is uh, Silas Rousseau. Silas is the president at California Ag Solutions. He received his college education at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and was blessed to grow up around agriculture his whole life. Driving tractors, irrigating fields, and figuring out how crops grow was a valuable education. Silas began his career at California Ag Solutions in the fall of 2008 as a customer account manager. In 2014, Silas began managing the day-to-day -day operations at California Ag Solutions and is now a business partner with founder Monty Botins. He drives to seek out the very best practices for California farmers, comes from his love of agriculture and technology. He's excited about the opportunity to work with new growers and help them find solutions to the problems they face. And lastly, we have Karen Lowell. She's a PhD and certified crop advisor 
and is an agronomist with the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. She is based in Salinas and her service area covers 15 counties in California, including the Central Coast, the Bay Delta region, and Modesto and Stockton in the Central Valley. Karen provides agronomy support for NRCS staff and works with individual farmers as well as a wide range of public and private partners supporting farmers as they manage conservation challenges in a complex production market with regulatory climate. Karen was an agriculture extension agent in Sierra Leone, West Africa with the Peace Corps, has a master's of science degree in agronomy from the University of Maryland and a PhD in soil crop and atmospheric science with a minor of horticulture from Cornell University. And that was, is what I have for our introductions. So I will pass it on to Trina. Thank you, Amy. And it looks like we had uh, Silas uh, join us. Um, he just needs to accept the promotion to panelist. Um, and then I will share my screen. Multitasking. Uh, good to hear so many of our speakers are fellow UC Davis alumni. Go Aggies. <laughs> So as Amy mentioned, I am the executive director of the East Stanislaus Resource Conservation District. And this is not working. That's why. One moment. Okay. That should be better. Okay. So uh, East Stanislaus, East Merced and Madera Chachilla RCDs have been working together to bring uh, more funding and programs available to our local landowners. Um, all, each of our RCDs are unique, but we all kind of um, have similar programming. Uh, we have both community programs and agricultural programs. So this uh, just a little introduction um, to what your local resource conservation district does. Uh, we are the go-between for our local landowners. We represent um, the landowners in our each individual county to help connect them to uh, state and federal um, fundings um, and sometimes beyond uh, bringing in uh, private funding opportunities as well uh, to offer educational and um, uh, implementation uh, in the field. So our community program examples, uh, community gardens, uh, river education days, uh, river cleanups, volunteer plantings, uh, recently just uh, completed a monarch habitat, uh, river riparian restoration, replanting, um, and uh, East Merced has a current permit to do some riparian uh, restoration. Agricultural program examples, uh, carbon farm planning, pollinator hedgerows, uh, mobile irrigation lab going out and doing irrigation evaluations and workshops, equipment rental programs, which is uh, in, in development right now with East Merced Resource Conservation District. Um, and then of course, conservation planning um, for everything from CDFA uh, sweep um, and what you'll hear about later from Paul on the RCPP. So this kind of all started in the, in the San Joaquin Valley when we brought together a soil health stakeholders group um, that was looking at drought resiliency. This was about in 2014. Uh, and from there, a lot of other uh, great projects that have been a boost to our Central Valley has included compost field trials, some cover crop field trials with the NRCS Plant Material Center. Again, the, the carbon uh, farm planning, uh, taking those uh, practices and, and presenting it with a carbon focus to take advantage of those markets. Um, and then we currently have an on-farm conservation innovation grant uh, with UC Merced to do um, soil health management in orchards. So for a mobile irrigation lab, again, uh, I know I saw a lot of uh, familiar names that may have re uh, recently attended our sweep workshops. So this might be familiar to you. Um, but uh, we go out and do distribution uniformity uh, testing. 
um, irrigation, the flow uniformity, the irrigation scheduling, and we provide the landowners with full reports and supporting documents. Uh, we also do some workshops and in the field training. So here's a couple of pictures of, uh, of RCDs out in the field, uh, doing a little bit of everything, uh, educating our youth and working with our landowners. Um, why we do this um, and why farmers have worked with us is the, you know, the, really the key is the sustainability for next generation. Um, they want to be able to pass their farms on um, to their kids and grandkids. Uh, but there's also some um, interesting uh, reasons behind it in regards to uh, market access. Uh, some of it's a processor requirement or a buyer's requirement or a certification requirement, um, especially when coming to the carbon farm plans that a lot of the reason uh, people are looking for those is future market access. A lot of the eco, there's a currently an ecosystem marketplace in place uh, in development um, and carbon exchange markets. And uh, most importantly, it's funding for farm improvements, whether it's an infrastructure improvement, like your improvement to your irrigation system or helping increase yields. Uh, one of the programs that we uh, have assisted um, in application and the application period is still open is the State Water and Energy Efficiency Program. You can contact East Merced RCD if you need assistance. That um, application period is open through uh, January. It is a first come first serve. Um, I believe they're right at 50, 50 or 60 percent of the funding has been awarded to this point. Uh, we currently have a monarch and pollinator habitat. Uh, we've been uh, Merced and Stanislaus have been in the process of creating our demonstration sites for future trainings. Uh, but we do have funding to implement additional pollinator hedgerows and cover crops and that's funded by the Xerces Society and we have a CDFA Fish and Wildlife funding for those. Uh, there's also uh, funding for integrated pest management. Uh, the NRCS practice standard really focuses on the prevention, avoidance, monitoring, and suppression. Um, uh, one uh, that is of uh, interest in our particular counties is the naval orange worm. And I know Almond Board of California is really working on some funding to help um, interrupt the life cycle uh, in a whole region. And so uh, being able to talk to groups like this so that um, you're aware of these opportunities so we can bring uh, landowners together to pursue this, um, these opportunities for funding to, to implement these practices. Uh, we develop RCDs, uh, do what we do um, through the partnerships that we've developed. Um, so for technical assistance, we've been able to develop partnerships um, for SWEEP, Healthy Soils, um, the Almond Board of California Sustainability Program, Department of Water Resources, Department of Conversation, uh, Con Conservation. And these are all funded by various partners so that we can provide those services free to the landowners. Um, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service is one of our um, main partners uh, for implementation of conservation on the ground. Um, they have various programs, uh, EQIP, you may be familiar with, uh, Environmental Quality Incentive Program, uh, CSP, Conservation Stewardship Program, that's uh, similar to EQIP, uh, except it's a five-year uh, progressive goal. Same with the CIC, Conservation Incentive Program, that was a newer program this past year. And uh, this is the lead-in for Paul Lum, who's with the American Farmland Trust, and he'll talk a little bit more about the Regional Conservation Partnership Program in which um, all three RCDs are participating in. Uh, so I just wanted to give a quick introduction to what your local RCD does um, so that uh, when opportunities arise, uh, you know who you can contact on the local level. And Paul, if you would like to go ahead and pick up from there to, to cover the um, Regional Conservation Partnership Program um, as a funding opportunity for implementation. Great, thank you. Paul Lum, Agriculture Specialist for American Farmland Trust, California region. Uh, first of all, can you see my slide? No. Okay. Uh, 
And I just double checked my settings to make sure that I didn't um, turn you off and it is on. So you should be able to. Okay. All right, let me see here. There we go. We see you're clicking. Do you see the presentation? We do. Okay, great. All right, I am sorry about that. Um, today I'm gonna cover some financial assistance options for cover crops. And um, primarily the NRCS EQIP program, uh, CDFA's Healthy Soils program, CDFA's SWEEP program, American Farmland Trust Regional Collaborative Partnership program, or RCPP, and um, a nonprofit support program that's Project Apis M, uh, and for growers, that's the Seed for Bees program. So going to um, EQIP, or that is funded and administered by Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. EQIP stands for Environmental Quality, Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And you can see it provides a broadest range of conservation program assistance. Here's an, an NRCS homepage. And um, you can see the uh, website address below the map. This is um, a nice map that shows the NRCS offices, uh, the districts, um, you know, and the counties. So in our counties, our region for this workshop, local field offices are in Modesto, Merced, and Madera. And there's a, um, this slide's basically depicting or illustrating the five steps to um, conservation practice assistance. And so that would include cover crops as well as many other um, equip practices. Those five steps would be the planning, the project, um, application eligibility, ranking, and farmer implementation. So equip uh, offices and staff will uh, you know, help the farmer process um, all of the steps. Going to move right into CDFA's Healthy Soils Program. Um, what is the Healthy Soils Incentive Program? Financial incentive program through CDFA, California Department of Food and Agriculture, pays farmers and ranchers to implement conservation management practices, including cover cropping, that sequester carbon and reduce atmospheric greenhouse gases while also improving soil health. Our local contact um, is below for the Healthy Soils um, Program, and um, that would be Katie Mong. Um, there's her email address, and she's primarily out of Merced, but I think she would be the go-to person if you're interested in, in the Healthy Soils Program, as well as our RCDs that are um, sponsoring this workshop. And this is on the homepage for SWEEP. Uh, that's the State Water Efficiency and Enhancement Program, um, funded and administered by CDFA. Um, and so on this, on this page, we'll provide quite a bit of information and links. Um, so SWEET provides financial assistance in the form of grants to implement irrigation systems that reduce greenhouse gases, save water on California farms. And eligible system components include among others, soil moisture monitoring, drip systems, switching to low pressure irrigation systems, pump retrofits, variable frequency drives, installation of renewable energy. Um, yeah, the, the goal of purpose and objective is to reduce on-farm water use and energy. So um, cover cropping is our topic today. And um, Cover cropping is not a direct incentive from SWEEP, but it's important for a SWEEP applicant. Um, cover cropping uh, enhances a SWEEP application. The farmer demonstrates adoption of irrigation efficiency practices, which cover crops enhance and improve irrigation efficiency. And it demonstrates practices that sequester carbon and reduces greenhouse gases. 
Uh, and our local um, technical assistance providers are listed below for Madera, Merced, Stanislaw, um, Rainey Patterson. Uh, there's her email address. Myself with my email address, Madera area, Amy Slisnoff. Now I'll talk about American Farmland Trust Regional Conservation Partnership Program. AFT formed the San Joaquin Valley Land and Conservation Collaborative. And um, through that collaborative, built a partnership between AFT, Freshwater Trust, and Conservation Biology Institute. Those are tech partners um, that are providing GIS platforms and mapping. Another partner is California Farmland Trust on the conservation easement side of our work. And for RCDs, East Stanislaw RCD, East Merced RCD, Madera Chowchilla RCD, Sierra RCD, and NRCS. So that, that, that um, makes up uh, the collaborative. And through the collaborative um, and the RCPP award, we're able to fund a number of conservation practices with the goal of reducing reliance on groundwater pumping um, and basically improving um, aquifer status, groundwater uh, status, water table um, for the region. And some of the practices that um, directly affect irrigation efficiency um, include cover cropping practices that related to um, direct planting of cover crops or conservation cover, um, no-till, reduced till. Critical area planting could uh, refer to cover crop planting in, in environmentally sensitive areas. Um, water, irrigation water management, um, including cover cropping as irrigation water um, approach. And cover cropping in upland wild, wildlife habitat management. There are other uh, conservation practices that the RCPP supports, but here's a list that directly um, is direct, directly related to cover cropping. I have a slide listing some nonprofit resources. Um, and mentioned before earlier, the Project Apis, Seeds for Bees, Xerxes Society, Pheasants Forever. I'm gonna talk about the Seeds for Bees program in the following slide. Educational resources for cover cropping and, and other types of conservation practices, California Alliance of Family Farmers. Certifications available um, to farmers, pollinator partnership. And of course, technical assistance through UC Cooperative Extension and RCDs. Um, key is below, there, there is not or may not be a perfect program for your farm, but we um, recommend and advocate considering multiple programs to find the best approach. It's a slide about the Seed for Bees program, um, provides technical assistance for cover crop seed mixes and management, um, custom seed blends um, that enhance pollinator activity, um, recommendations for those seed blends, um, pointing to uh, where to purchase, what dealers to go to, and um, possibility of seed discounts for, um, for farmers that enroll in the program. Um, Billy Sink is the director of the, of the program um, and there's his email address and phone number. So thank you for allowing me to present. Um, there's my contact info below. Um, please let me know if you have any questions either today or, or later on. And now I'll pass the presentation on to Anna Gomez and Jeff Mitchell. Thank you, Paul, and uh, the many sponsors and supporters of this webinar for this opportunity to be with you this morning. Uh, as we're getting started here, I'd just like to express uh, my very sincere appreciation to the uh, 
uh, my co-presenting partner, Anna Gomes here. Uh, it has been a true honor uh, to, to prepare for today with her. And I think you'll all quickly see that uh, uh, the, the coming next generations uh, are very talented and uh, earnest and dedicated uh, to the work that we're talking about today. So Anna, do you wanna start the... Can you see the slides? Not yet, no. Okay. I can. Okay, there we go. So what we'd like to do this morning is first provide some background to the, to the topic of today, cover crops for drought resiliency by sharing findings from a unique long-term study that has taken place right here in the San Joaquin Valley. And then to answer a number of questions that commonly come up regarding the, uh, the use of cover crops. The team that we are part of, Anna and I, uh, it involves a number of people, including uh, Samuel Sandoval Solis and Daniel, Daniele Zachariah at Davis, as well as Alyssa DeVincentis. Uh, what we'd like to do also is remind you that if you wanna look at a little bit in more depth at some of the water-related impacts of cover cropping that we're gonna be talking about, we prepared a, a webinar on that about uh, 28 minutes or so worth it's on YouTube. You just search Jeff Mitchell YouTube channel and you'll see it. Okay, let's start off right now with some general principles that now have become really underlying what we are talking about today as either regenerative or conservation agriculture systems, soil health management systems, or just the fundamentals of natural ecosystems. Worded in various ways, these principles include the ideas of reduced disturbance or reduced tillage, keeping the soil covered, biological diversity, and keeping living roots in the this, this soil throughout as much of the year as possible. I point out that the integration of these principles, and particularly the ones of reduced disturbance and soil surface cover, have enabled production, go to the next slide there, Anna, uh, to be sustained in regions very similar to our San Joaquin Valley, such as Western Australia, where the average annual rainfall is about 10 inches, as well as regions like South Dakota, where if you read the, the caption there, a spiral of soil regeneration uh, largely coming from reduced disturbance and surface residue cover has allowed uh, complete changes in the diversification and the uh, uh, intensification of cropping in that region. Now, the goal then of integrating or coupling these soil health principles into the sorts of cropping systems that we have in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, click through the couple of uh, highlights there, that's good has been a driving aspect of our work. What we've tried to do is develop information about conservation or regenerative ag systems, soil health management systems. That's the bottom goal there. On the left side of that is the, the, the avenue of cover cropping. And we've tried to explore over the last many, many years, various aspects of cover crop that have been important about that, that goal. The next slide, just about 50 miles or so south of where many of you are, near the small town of Five Points, is one of 124 long-term study sites that are now part of the Soil Health Institute's broad evaluation of measurement metrics for soil health. The site in Five Points is a unique location at which we've been comparing the impacts of four different systems conventional tillage with and without cover crops and no tillage with and without cover crops for about 22 years. Over the course of this period, the cover crops have produced about 35 tons of organic matter per acre or the equivalent of about 17 tons of carbon uh, that have been added to the soil and to the pro production system. Now, one of the things that it has come out of this, you can see the changes, the really dramatic changes. The soil on the right is the conventional no-till soil. The soil aggregate on the left, when we drop it in water, 
That's the no-till with cover crop soil. So really after about, well, this was done about 20, after 20 years of different management implementation, you can see here with the other one there, quite striking and dare I say dramatic changes in the aggregation or the structure or the stability of that aggregate there. It's literally disintegrating or dissolving right before our eyes there. Uh, the video seems to be a little slow, so we'll, we'll leave, we'll go on beyond that there. But in addition, in this long-term study, we've also seen changes in several indicators of overall biodiversity, with greater diversity related to higher soil carbon, water infiltration, and aggregate stability characteristics re that result from the cover cropping. Macrofauna, those large organisms in the soil, include important ecosystem engineers like earthworms, ants, and termites that are, that are uh, abundant there. Now, Anna is going to share important findings from this long-term study related to water impacts of cover crops. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you for the kind introduction. It's been super fun to work with Jeff. Um, starting about five years ago during my, my bachelor degree at UC Davis, and now we've come back together for this presentation. So thank you for, for inviting me to join. And yeah, as Jeff um, set up very nicely here, a lot of the kind of impacts that we see from cover crops um, definitely impact the soil water system, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So as you all know, growers face many water challenges in California. And we're going to go through eight different um, questions surrounding the growth of cover crops today. So first, to start off, how do cover crops impact the soil water system? And specifically, we're talking about winter cover crops. So these are the cover crops that are grown during this cool, hopefully wet winter season between November and March um, every year. So as you can see as the graph on the left are laboratory determinations of aggregate stability. So what Jeff was also showing in the video, indicate increases with cover crops relative to fallow surface soils. And likewise, in the graph on the right, data from soil water infiltration studies show marked increases in the soil's ability to take in water as rainfall or as irrigation. And in areas that get more rainfall than we get in the central San Joaquin Valley, soils that are covered by winter cover crops are protected from disaggregation, surface crusting, and runoff relative to bare soil surfaces. We've had some growers refer to this as the, the armor of the soil, the, the protective of the soil. And when cover crops are left on the soil surface, they act as a mulch. And our research, as well as considerable work from other research studies, has shown that a reduction of about four inches of soil water evaporation can occur during a typical San Joaquin Valley grummer, summer growing period. This is about 13% of an estimated crop ET of 30 inches. And we have seen the benefits of using cover crops as mulch for reducing evaporation, but even with a thick, dense surface mulch, we have found that you typically cannot get season-long weed control. And I'll reiterate that as a hint, <laughs> you cannot get season-long weed control from growing winter cover crops, but they do help. Sorry, the weed roller came out just now. Um, so to answer the first question, the mechanisms underlying the water-related impacts of winter cover cropping are complex, but let's talk about them a bit in this diagram. So relative to bare soil surfaces, winter cover crop surfaces, yes, have some measure of transpiration, which I'll talk about next, but cover crops also lead to lower soil temperatures, reduced wind speed, and lower ground heat transfer which all combine to reduce soil evaporation. Raise soil biological activity, as Jeff mentioned before, with a macrofauna and can capture dew moisture. Also, these cover crops are grown during a period of lower overall ET, which is during the cooler winter growing period. And non-cover crop soils, as you can see here on the right, also lose water via evaporation and at times can have these crusted surfaces that lead to sealing, ponding, and runoff. So next, don't all cover crops, like all plants, need water to grow? Let's look at the data. Cover crops, these winter cover crops are not generally substantial water users as shown by the graphs. 
On the left, you have actual evapotranspiration for cover cropped and for non cover cropped fields during the 2017 2018 season. The top and bottom graphs show from Davis, California, and Five Points, California. And the green and brown show cover cropped in green and control fields in brown with fallow fields. And the two main conclusions from this graph is that although Davis, California, and Five Points, California, Five Points is the study, long term study site that Jeff introduced at the beginning have different climates and different precipitation patterns. The differences in actual evapotranspiration for both locations between cover crop and control fields is negligible. The difference amounts to less than an inch of water, which is tiny in the scheme of the annual consumptive water use. Even if there is nothing growing on the field in the wintertime, like we mentioned before, there is water loss through evaporation. And adding a cover crop during a dry year does not increase the actual evapotranspiration by any substantial amount. Let me just try to close the window once again, sorry. Okay. On the right, we looked at 10 fields and we grouped them into three different systems, as you can see on the bottom axis. This is um, almond orchards with cover crops and native vegetation, and then annual rotation fields with winter cover crops. We figured out when the soil was saturated with water, and then we looked at the end of the cover crops life cycle and back calculated how much of water was left in the soil after the cover crops were grown. And you can see here in the chart that there is no statistical differences between the cover crop and the control or the fallow plots. So to answer the second question, don't cover crops use water like all plants? Yes, they do, but it is a small amount due to the low evapotranspiration in the wintertime. And with this improved soil water holding capacity from the cover crops themselves, they hold more water than the fallow plots. So some of the additional water can be used by the cover crops to grow. So the overall effect is null and soil water is not depleted. And we believe that the water is worth it. So the water that the cover crops use to grow is, is more than worth it due to their improvement in soil structure and aggregation. Uh, so the availability of soil biology, soil water infiltration and retention, and many other benefits, including air quality, they help with weed management, um, labor savings, and also biological pest control. Our third question today, how does combining reduced disturbance tillage with winter cover cropping affect the soil water content? And this is important because we need to consider cover crops as not only a sole practice. Once it time, comes time to plant the next cash crop, the cover crops must either be tilled in or carefully managed in a no-till environment. And the effect of the way they're terminated will affect the water impact. So these results come from the long-term study that Jeff talked about that over 20 years of doing reduced disturbance tillage and cover cropping. And we looked at uh, three years between March, uh, November 2016 and March 2019. And you can see here on the left, these are differences in soil water content between the different treatments. And you can see the blue here all the way to the left is the largest difference between the two uh, treatments. So that's comparing standard tillage with down cover crops and reduced disturbance tillage with cover crops. And while this is the greatest difference between all of the treatments, it's important to note that this is only a third of an inch of water. It's a very small amount. And on the right, you can see this is the water down the whole profile. And I will point your attention to the center column here that from 2017 to 2018, which was the lowest cumulative rainfall um, at five points between the three years, the reduced disturbance cover crop treatment plots actually had the most soil water all down the profile. So to answer the third question, combining winter cover crops with reduced disturbance tillage leads to additional water storage with tillage being the dominant factor. Okay, number four, what about pest problems from growing cover crops? So to answer the fourth question, it is worthwhile to mention that the specific interactions between cover crops and pests that growers may be particularly concerned with, and our emphasis is on the word specific, also another hint. Um, each cover crop system, pest organism, and ecosystem service of the cover crop leads to unique situations that require crop specific research and recommendations. So we're talking about two examples here, almonds and grapes, two crop systems with huge geographic and economic footprints in California. In almonds, 
Certain cover crop species can be used to reduce pressure from rodents, nematodes, or enable orange worm. Cover crop termination strategies and the age of the orchard also affect how a cover crop may impact pest pressure on almond trees. In grapes, certain cover crop species can be avoided to interfere with reproduction of the three-cornered alfalfa leaf hopper, a vector of red blotch. The fifth question, how do cover crops affect soil greenhouse gas emissions? So research was done by Jeffrey Coach, our very own Jeff Mitchell, and Dr. William Horwath, also from UC Davis, at the same field in Five Points, California over the 2018-2020 field seasons. And the data was collected by these authors and I'm just interpreting it for this presentation. But other cover crop research projects have expressed concerns about the production of nitrous oxide emissions, which is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, which kind of could outweigh, so to speak, the carbon that's sequestered from growing cover crops. However, the research and the soil gas emissions that were captured at the NRI field in five points showed that the emissions were very low, close to baseline, and they were not statistically different between the cover crop and the fallow soil treatments. This is due, this is hypothesized to be due to the use of subsurface irrigation, which keeps the soil pretty dry than in order it would need to be to be a nitrous oxide source. So to answer question five, in this case, cover crops did not lead to increase N2O emissions. Okay, back to Jeff to answer the rest of your, of our important cover crop questions. Thank you very much, Anna. Our next question is, do all cover crop species behave the same? And our, our quick answer to this, and you are all anticipating it, is no. Cover crop species can vary widely depending on a number of different factors, including a farmer's management goals, some of which are shown here, that include you know, uh, rooting depth, scavenging nitrogen, and uh, different characteristics that a farmer might be after. Now, speaking of cover crops with respect to scavenging nitrogen, a lot of work with cover crops in the Salinas Valley was recently used in advocating for cover crop nitrogen credits as part of what they have over there called their Ag Order 4.0. Uh, and this information was presented to the Central Coast Water Board just a couple of months ago. Their ag order now includes incentives for farmers for the use of compost, organic fertilizer amendments, and cover crops to improve soil health, increase moisture retention, and carbon and nitrogen sequestration. This recommendation, and we're borrowing uh, data and information from a whole team of people over in the Salinas area there, is highlighted above that red arrow there. Their recommendation was this, that if you grow cover crops that have a C to nitrogen, carbon to nitrogen ratio greater than 20, and you grow them for at least three months in the winter rainy period, and that those cover crops achieve a dry weight shoot biomass of at least 4,500 pounds per acre, that there is low or no risk of nitrate leaching, and that farmers ought to receive a credit for this practice providing a carrot, as you can see over to the right there, rather than a stick in terms of moving toward improved resource management might be a very good thing. And as well, the nitrate, as Eric Brennan, who made the, the bulk of the presentation to the water board said, the nitrate that is captured by the cover crop will actually eventually cycle back and may ultimately be taken up by the crops such as carrots, almonds, or tomatoes that we all eat. Okay, our next question is, how long will it take before I start seeing changes uh, in, in the system uh, attributes? A host of long-term research shows that it takes time to accrue benefits of cover cropping. In the long-term study that we've shared information with you here this morning, differences were not seen until after at least eight or so years. Let's look at the data. Here's another study. These results are from a study conducted up in Solano County with two fields that have had different management history and that are only a mile or so away from each other. The light blue farm had been cover crop for a decade, 10 years, while the blue field was newly cover crop 
for this experiment. With moisture increasing as you go down in the soil profile, you can see that the long-term benefits of cover cropping can be significant and that they're not seen instantaneously. Finally, our last question here, how can we monitor improvements and what could a farmer maybe do to uh, keep track of uh, changes? There are several things that we think farmers might consider doing that are quite simple, easy to do, in order to learn about more about cover cropping and the impacts of cover cropping on soil health. First of all, just go out and measure the height of your cover crop. That's something very easy to do. And it, there are relationships between measuring the height and the next item here would be collect, dry, and weigh the amount of biomass in your cover crop. It's really been exciting to see a number of farmers that we're working on in one large scale project who themselves are now actually doing this. And they've become quite, quite fascinated and quite knowledgeable now about cover crop biomass productivity, just as a result of putting a, a meter stick out in the field, collecting and weighing the dry matter there. Other things you can all do, just do simple determinations uh, of soil aggregate stability. There are now readily available tools, some of which are little uh, de dunking demonstration tools. One is actually a mobile phone app called Slakes that you can use. And just repeat those, those little exercises over time. You'll learn an awful lot. The last thing I show in the lower left-hand corner, or we show, is that just take a ring, take a six-inch irrigation pipe, figure out a, a, an inch worth of water, and time the amount it takes for one, two, three, or four inches of water to infiltrate, and then repeat that over time and see what you, you, you find. These are some suggestions here. Anna, you're going to now wrap it up here with some conclusions. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. So let's review the main takeaway messages from, from today. First is that cover crops drastically improve the soil health. This includes the soil biology and function, the structure, and also the aggregation. Second, they do use water to grow, but it is a minimal amount. Third, tillage matters. So how you terminate your cover crops at the end really influences how your water um, content happens. So tillage and termination of the cover crops matters. So influence of your machinery. Fourth, not all cover crop species are created equal. Some are better for biomass creation, carbon sequestration. Some are more equipped for nitrogen scavenging. So make sure you look into the different um, species and uh, climate that you're growing them in to try to optimize your cover crop benefits. Fifth, the pest problems are unique to the crop and the pest system. So also make sure to look into um, the specifics around your cropping system. Sixth, cover crops don't eliminate full season weeds. They still sneak through, but they do aid in weed prevention and management. Seven, soil change takes time, but it can be monitored as Jeff just reviewed some different strategies. And eight, we do believe that cover crops improve on-farm water management. And our data definitely shows that cover crops, although they use water to grow, it is very minimal. And compared to bare foul soils, it is not statistically different. So, Planting cover crops has all of these other medium and long-term health benefits, and we do believe that they can be a very effective drought um, resiliency strategy for California growers. Uh, thank you so much for having us today, and we really look forward to your questions. I also, again, apologize for the, for the noise that just happened to turn on the leaf blower as soon as I started uh, talking here, um, but I guess that's the adventure of presenting on Zoom. So thank you again for your time, and um, yeah, we look forward to your questions. Okay, we have a question on the chat. Where, when, where can we find information on pest problems to specific crop systems? Is there a list or someone that can talk to uh, to prescribe certain cover crops? I think uh, part of that, we, Anna has developed a, a short list anyway, and by all means, the, the person who asked the question, uh, we can provide what we've done in preparation for today's discussion. But yeah, there are lots of, uh, shall I say, you know, 
crop specific experts uh, around that we could uh, uh, put our heads together and, and come up with some uh, a resource list for people. So by all means, contact us and we'll, we'll try to help our best with that. Yeah, and I will just put one uh, resource in the chat. This was put together by one of our teammates um, and other, oh yes. Um, and uh, Anna, for, Anna yeah. the links that you're posting, uh, you need to select it to post to everyone. It's only going to the host, the panel. Ah, okay, thank you for and that, sorry the, about that. You you'd posted a YouTube link back as well. Yeah, that was our YouTube link for our longer video. Let okay, me there you go. That again. Thanks. And then uh, there was a question that uh, if the presentations were going to be available, and I believe that um, Amy uh, usually uh, collects all of those presentations and makes them available to the um, to the attendees. Is that correct, Amy? Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll add the recording um, to our website, and we can send it out to everybody who attended as well. So it'll be available to rewatch after the presentation. And there's uh, links to a YouTube video and the resources that Anna referenced earlier in the chat box. And I'll give a couple more minutes to wait for any other. Okay, so we have another question in regards to almond farmers uh, that must perform a mummy shake in January or February, then flail mow them. How do farmers using cover crops address this? Um, I I'm I don't know um, the specifics of this. Uh, Alyssa DeVincentes, who is the researcher who led the almond farm cover crop research, I will send her this this question and then send the answer um, to Amy, so then we can get this um, out to you. Okay, perfect. There's also another question. It says in trees and vines, the irrigation is on the berms. The cover crops are in the middle. They use little applied water, correct? Okay, there are lots of variations on the general theme about uh, uh, whether, far, whether people are gonna irrigate cover crops in certain, certain cropping systems there. So I, it, I mean, it's everything from people might consider in some orchards, people are moving drip lines out to, into the middle area where cover crops are growing. People are growing cover crops just right in a stri single strip right next to the tree line there. There are people that for sure are not irrigating whatsoever and just relying on winter rain. So the management practices are pretty much uh, uh, very wide and, and diverse and across the board there. Again, if, if, if somebody has specific questions that I can, or we can help with, uh, send us an email and we'll put you in contact with uh, better information. But, but there's just a lot of variability out there in order to answer that question, I think. Okay, and there's yeah, one last- please email us. Oh yeah, um, oh, it looks like we have two, two new more. questions. Uh, so it says, are there, other little to no till techniques you'd suggest besides mowing to terminate cover crops? Yeah, for, for sure, again, I mean, the use of cover cropping uh, in, in, in annual cropping systems, traditionally cover crops, and many of you know this, have been used as green manures where they're actually mowed or chopped and then they're, they're incorporated into the soil with a disc or a plow or some kind of a, disturbance implements. So yeah, people have historically done that uh, to, to make the cover crops disappear. What we've been showing here this morning was largely taking advantage of the residues on the soil surface and not, not disturbing the, the soil surface there. But again, there's a lot of diversity out there. Uh, there's not as much tillage that's obviously done in orchards or vineyards these days. And yet there probably is some shallow incorporation or disking of cover crops in those two permanent cropping systems as well. So it's, it's hard to treat everything with a, a blanket, uh, you know, answer to this stuff because there's so much management variability out there. But again, if people are interested in some of the diversity 
as well as some of the innovations. My suspicion is that later on in the program, both Tom and Silas are gonna show uh, not only species diversity and innovation, but management uh, innovation that's really exciting. And it's out there uh, quite recent times there. So stay tuned, I think folks. Okay. And we've had four new questions come through, but um, because of time, we're gonna move on to Tom's presentation and we'll have the Q&A session at the end uh, to kind of go through the additional questions. And Speakers, if, uh, if you pay attention to the chat, there might be some that you can go ahead and just uh, respond with uh, an answer directly through the chat box. Thank you. Okay, so um, Anna, if you're able to stop your screen share and Tom, if you'd like to begin your presentation, that would be perfect. Okay, well, here goes nothing then, so. In the beginning, start. So, okay, cool. Um, my name is Tom Johnson. I work for a, a cover crop seed company. So, um, they asked me to talk about integrated pest management and cover crops. And quite a few of the things that I brought up or wanted to bring up were already touched on here. Let's see if this works. Cool. So, we're gonna we're gonna make a left turn here a little bit and go. Okay, well, IPM or integrated pest management is defined as a flexible approach to managing complex system level pest problems. Whether that's the regional navel orange worm um, mating disruption or your 20 acre ranch outside the back door. So you're going to you set your IPM program based on your ecosystem and it's an approach to preventing or solving a problem. You know, I have a problem or you don't want a problem. So you're using a combination of tools and you're trying to make all those things work together. So sometimes they do work together, sometimes they don't. Uh, what was brought up just recently was, okay, well, I got a mummy shake, but I got to mow and flail mow the mummies. How's that affect that? Um, that's something you think about when you're, when you're designing your whole system here. And it's, and also mentions long-term approach. Um, you're not going to make that bug or that weed or that issue go away right away. And cover crop is a tool. So you're, what you use the first year is not necessarily going to be the next because it's not a rule driven program. So some of the things we can impact with these, with a, with a cover crop on an IPM program, insects, um, weeds, soil borne pests, dust and erosion, soil water interactions, and even the climate within our crop. Um, all this stuff's already been touched on a little bit, so we'll get to skim a little bit, maybe. So the most common thing everybody thinks of when you say IPM and cover crop is the insectary row or the beneficial habitat. So most of these mixes are a really diverse mix of species. They'll have flowers and legumes and grasses and forbs and Lord knows what all else. Um, but we're not exactly sure what we're getting out of this. Uh, there was a program they've relaunched now, um, looking at what comes out of that cover crop. But most of the time, what we see is you just get more generalist predators out there that are preying on your pests. It acts that bio, that biologically diverse insectary row out there acts as an attractant. So now you could go to one place and sweep the stuff on the ground and see what's coming on. Um, it also acts as an attractant where you can treat that area. Um, when a threshold hits, hits on an insect and you see that, okay, everything's starting to dry up and they're gonna move out of that into my trees, it's easier to spray with a boom sprayer on the ground than it is to spray the trees with an air blast, especially with an insecticide or a pesticide of some kind or another. At least that's my opinion. You're gonna treat a smaller area basically with the same amount of material and stop off or, or slow something down. <clears throat> so choosing which one you're gonna, what cover crop you're gonna use to impact those insects. Um, like I said, everybody thinks of that flowery row out there that attracts all the insects. Well, some of those beneficials need pollen or nectar as an adult, but they all need something to eat. And I think where we're gonna find is that in our modern agricultural agriculture, especially in perennial crops, almonds and walnuts and vines and whatever out, else is out there, we're farming it where there's, it's monoculture of a perennial crop and there's no shelter out there. So 
having a cover crop acting as shelter is going to be structure. So the spiders have a place to put up webs, catch leaf hoppers. Um, the little insects have a place to hide from the other insects that want to eat them. They have a chance to grow up and then they hopefully will move up into your trees when you terminate your cover crop and continue to provide that uh, control of the insects that you're working on, working against or, or trying to control. So your management, and I underline that because management has a lot to do with what you're going to get out of it. Um, if possible, leave some structure out there. Stubble, six inch tall barley stems out there can provide six inches of places for the spiders to be working. Leave it out there as long as you can. Um, I know a lot of almond growers recreationally mow about the 1st of April and then mow every 30 days afterwards. Um, that makes a lot of dust. Why don't you leave it out there, not, not mow that one the 1st of April and, and come back in May and do it. It will go away. That's what they're all afraid of. And if you've got flowers out there, let it finish flowering. Um, a lot of, I see a lot often times that they'll go out and mow the dang thing as soon as it stops flowering. Well, nothing, no seed comes back the next year if that's what they're trying to manage it for. And so some of these subtle, subtle side effects, we go to a lot of these meetings and you pick up these things as you go along here. Um, these side effects that we get, um, the cover crop plants may be more attractive than the crop at some stages. I mean, alfalfa strips and cotton for ligus control. Radish and pistachios, same thing, ligus control. Um, you have radish out there, it's flowering. The, li the ligus is all working that, and they're not up in your pistachios. Alyssum and lettuce, um, proven to work. It reduces the, reduces the lettuce aphid because you're increasing your hoover flies and various other things that will work against that. One long-term cover cropper has found that he doesn't have any husk fly because their life cycle requires they fall down, down to the ground and pupate in the soil. And then as they're trying to come out, everything in that active soil and that mulch out there eats them before they get out. So they're, they're controlled at that stage. Um, and then the NOI question, okay, well, we got a cover crop growing out there. Uh, yeah, anyways. You got increased soil moist, surface moisture out there. So there's more fungus, it's cooler, it's wetter. Fewer navel orange worms survived in those mummy nuts in a cover crop. In the spring, the first moss couldn't find the mummies on the ground as easily because there's just so much clutter that they have to like get through. So they laid fewer eggs. It's not a cure-all, it's not a silver bullet, but on the other hand, you made a, made a difference on it. That's if you could maintain, leave it out there. Um, you may want to leave every other row open and then sweep all your mummies into one, one row that you can mow easily without affecting your cover crop and then come back the next year and plant a cover crop the next one. So that, and a lot of these things mean you're out there looking real hard to find. That's why they're subtle. They're, they're side effects. Um, they're a happenstance that's kind of happy about the whole thing. So if we're going to go after weeds, using a cover crop um, and it's it's an e semi-effective thing in a perennial crop it's probably better so in a in an annual system provided you know a few things so we do need, need the same things as your cover crop plants do they need space light water and fertility so if you start install something out there um, you're going to help keep those weeds somewhat at bay because now you have something competing with it that you're managing you put it in, put it in there on purpose. You're not going to make much impact on perennial weeds, um, mostly because they're perennial. They have other than reseeding, they have other ways of surviving. Um, so you then, okay, well, I want to chase weeds with my cover crop. So what do we use? You got to use something that's competitive, so it comes up and grows fast. Brassicas come to mind real fast on that. Small grains do another job on that. Um, biomass production, it's got to grow fast and out, outstrip the weeds or at least keep up with them. But then we're back to this, it has to fit the program. Um, you don't need a six foot tall cover crop out there if you didn't want it there in the first place. So when, so you gotta plant, plant your cover crop before the weeds sprout. Um, I don't know how many times I've watched where they planted into weeds and then wondered why they never saw anything. Um, then when you're out there managing it in the spring, Knowing what weeds you're up against, mow before the weeds are making seed. 
the cover crop is a tool. You're using it for several purposes. This is one of. So if it's six inches tall and the weeds are three inches tall and starting to make seed, you can mow it two inches tall, knock the tops off the weeds, and your six inch cover crop may come back a little bit more. So how do you use it? Again, we're managing width. If you have sprayed berms and you're trying to keep them clean, okay, but if you're trying to control the weeds out there at the wetting front on the edge of your sprayed berm, you need to plant your cover crop that reaches out there and competes there. And then your termination strategy. Again, you're going, okay, well, I want to beat back that weed. So you need to know what its life cycle is and then term terminate your cover crop to match terminating those weeds. So soil-borne pests. This is probably one of the biggest questions we always get on cover crops when we start talking about IPM and cover cropping. Soil-borne pests, nematodes, and soil pathogens. I always kind of look at it as, hey, it's a jungle down there if we can make it work better. We beat our soils to death, so we need to increase our soil biology. That way, there's something down there that eats everything, just like in the jungle. Um, incorporating mustards or brassica cover crops for nematode control or soil pathogen, pathogen control depends on proper timing and everything else. And in a cover crop, in a perennial crop, you're growing it in the middles, not under the trees where you're measuring your nematodes. So don't know how much control you're actually gonna get. Why I say this is there's a guy in Northern California that has reduced his lesion nematodes just by allowing and having a really thick, diverse cover crop growing out there. And he brought his ground back to life. And then, like I said, there's always something down there that's gonna eat something else. So cover cropping is not a silver bullet. But it's part of that whole program. So you're going to increase your water infiltration, various other fun things. All these things come back to roost. And, and as was, was also said, it's going to take some time, two to five years. Usually about three years, people start to see a difference. Um, the big trick's getting them to continue the practice more than two. So dust reduction, you know, it's not necessarily a pest in the traditional sense, but it is something we got to think about. Unfavorable soil conditions, there's trees and vines being planted on a lot, a lot of ground that is, you know, they have water, so it can grow them, but it's not necessarily what you should have been doing. Direct correlation, you know, everybody knows the dustier your orchard is, the more likely you are to have mites. If you leave the res, if you mow the cover crop and just leave that residue laying out there, every time you drive through, you're going to make a little less dust. Um, and then on Unfavorable soil conditions. There's a lot of clay ground out there with huge cracks in the summertime because there wasn't a whole lot of organic matter out there in the first place. Cover cropping is now going to start helping glue that back together again. When they demonstrated those two clods dissolving in, in the dish of water, the cover crop non-tillage high organic matter soil that held together has got a lot of glue holding it together. Whereas if we beat it to death, it's going to fall apart. There's nothing there. The other thing going on is, okay, rather than disking your cover crop in, leaving that residue, a mowed residue on top of the surface, if nothing else, the cracks are still going to open up, but that residue is going to fall in there and keep a few of those almonds from going, disappearing down that crack. So then choosing your right system for your dust reduction. So your soil conditions, you know, if you got sandy soil, loam soil, clay soil, um, number one is probably leaving residue on the surface and increase number two be increasing your organic matter that makes your soil hold together better less flaky off flaking off but you do have to have harvest considerations this was in walnuts and he could mow that down close enough that basically he could still sweep walnuts all up off of it almonds would get lost in that you could mow it tight enough and have expect it to live through it um, in grapes, if it's dried on the vine, who cares if there's still stuff on the ground out in the middle? But if you're drawing, drying it on the ground on trays, you have to have that harvestable floor. Um, chestnuts, usually you can have a whole lot, or yeah, chestnuts, hazelnuts, you can have a whole lot of, of residue down there because they're great big things. They come up, eat, they pick up easily. So it's something to consider when you're going, okay, what kind of, what system, what, what 
type of cover crop am I going to put in there? To keep a sod like this live requires full full coverage sprinklers as well, though. That's one of the drawbacks of it on in most of our agriculture strip only. So the cover crop effect on erosion, offsite movement, soil fertility, and pesticides. Again, not necessarily when you say pest does this come to mind, but it kind of falls in that in that management thing or that that crop production thing that like I need to reduce that. I need I don't need that so much. Um, so you got you got a cover crop out there. So the plants are protecting the soil. We talked about armor, and then if you know you've overcome the water applications overcome the infiltration rate, the stems flow that slow that water down as it's trying to flow across the surface. It backs it up. So then it, it'll has longer time to chance in. Cut the roots off, cut the tops off and the root channels, but don't disturb the soil. The root channels remain. That dries up. That leaves kind of an almost direct channel from the surface into the soil. This is usually one of the biggest things we hear about when people do a cover crop the first time is like, well, you know, water's run off of this place for 20 years and I put a cover crop out there and we had a wet winter and no water ran off. And then drift reduction, pest, you know, pesticide applications, um, insecticide or fungicide applied with air blast sprayers. Everybody's seen the great cloud falling around there. And that all settles down there. But if you've got a standing cover crop, you increase the surface area for that soil, that spray deposition to photograde probably by about tenfold. If it's all laying on the surface, it gets all the same amount of daylight, but you've got all that vertical surface now that's getting having that deposition on it, more, more places for photodegradation, which is how most pesticides basically degrade. Um, soil water interactions, this was covered very well by, by Anna and Jeff. So I'm not gonna beat, beat the drum very much on it. You get better water infiltration, you get better water holding capacity, and those are both really important. And then the environmental effects on the climate. Number one or number two question a lot of times on people asking about uh, what's this gonna do? A study a couple of years ago when we did have a one heck of a frost at bloom time um, by the almond board basically found there was no impact on temperature at three feet above the soil surface during a hard frost. There aren't too many flowers right down on the ground most of the time they are at three to five feet. And they found that basically it was the air temperature was not lower, not significantly higher, but it was not lower at that zone than it would be on the ground. Then during the summer, your orchard floor soil temperatures, you know, cooler. They pointed out slower evaporation because of that residue laying out there. It's shaded. Um, cover crop uses some soil moisture. And then I'm going to say this again it's a production tool. If it's not working, it's not doing what you expect it to do or doing too much of something you didn't want. It's time to pull back, take that one out, and start over again. Not necessarily, you know, there's always something good you get out of it, but maybe something worse, and that's what you need to evaluate. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There's some hurdles to consider before adopting this, and, and hopefully you're doing it at the kitchen table, not behind the wheel on your way to the seed company. Um, you're introducing another management practice to your operation. So you have to consider establishment and management in conjunction with all your other operations, your winter mowing, your sanitation efforts, post-harvest irrigation, so on and so forth. You want to plant this in the fall. Um, planting it in the spring, as the internet would tell you, is probably not a good idea when considering it usually stops raining by mid-May in California and doesn't rain again for six or eight months. And rain is what's going to grow most of your cover crop. Um, the other one is, is your orchard or vineyard's going to look a little different. There's stuff on the ground out there. It's not, not, not a beautiful billiard table out there with trees sticking out of it. Uh, they have an impact on your microclimate. You may have increased humidity, um, which may be whole rot issue, depending on where you're at. You have that temperature modification, may not warm up as fast and may cool off slower, so on and so forth. You do have the potential of harbor, harboring pathogens or virus vectors. Three cornered alfalfa hopper and red blotch um, with that increased humidity or whatever, you may have a powdered mildew potential. Um, changes in your floor management are often going to lead to changes in what weeds you have out there. Um, now you're out there mowing it early, 
and you're not going to top off the annual bluegrass, but then something else shows up. A lot of times I'll see a lot more Malva start showing up when they go to a mowing only regime because Malva kind of likes to be mowed. Um, puncture vine would be the same way. Might increase the rodents, another vertebrate pests. You might not. My opinion is most people see more gophers out there because now they're looking to see if it's coming up and growing. Uh, squirrels, birds don't kill the burrowing owls, so they're protected. And this is kind of how to get a hold of me if you've got questions. Camp Rass Seeds, a wholesale company, so we work through a dealer network all up and down the state. And if your advisor can't answer the question, they end up calling me. So that should take care of that. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so next, uh, we can move on. I believe we have um, a couple of questions that were left in the chat. Um, so one of them was, is there any research discussing the survivability of now in mummies that have been blown or swept into middles of a cover crop system? Um, Dr. Houston and five points has been doing some work on it and actually that was what i looked at it he had found a significant just decrease in survivability of you know of navel orange worm in mummies on the floor mode or not mode so that was kind of what i was basing that on and it kind of you know they're, they're trying to figure out why but i would say that yeah there's more fungus and, and colder wetter on the floor surface right there that's kind of affecting how well they live through it And like I said, it doesn't eliminate all of them such as it probably is similar to a black line of mummies swept into the middle and being flail mode, but it's not going to be exactly the same. And you are going to mow that cover crop, so that is going to be a practice. And you could do that a little later than February and probably still eliminate most of the mummies that are in that cover crop. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then we have um, another question. Is cover crops supposed to reduce water loss from evaporation of bare soil cover? And with a, lo a lower evaporation and actual transpiration rate, would that cause the temperature at the ground level, let me see here, I have to scroll down, to be, oh my goodness. Um, I'm sorry, give me a second. Um, let's see here, to be lower than for a bare ground cover. That could yeah, be. If, if you swept the mulch off and measured the soil temperature, it would out in a, versus, versus a bare patch that's getting the same amount of sunlight. The shade of the mulch itself is going to keep the soil temperature at the surface at least cool. A lot of times what we will see, and it's, you know, it's not forever and ever it's a couple of weeks difference basically is go out and take your foot and you sweep the mulch aside and the bare patch is dry on the surface and where you just swept that mulch off it's still pretty moist and you can still get the soil probe in the ground without jumping up and down on it so it, it makes that a difference it's I, it will slow the eto et but I, or the evaporation off the soil surface you know i don't think it'll stop it completely because at the same time that mulch is getting thinner because it's further desiccating, it's further drying down. So what was a solid cover post lawnmower um, gets thinner and thinner over time. And eventually you do start to see soil surface underneath of it. So, but it'll, if you're not gonna save an irrigation, you're not gonna do a whole lot of things, but you are gonna keep soil moisture in there. Soil moisture and roots are what keep your soil biology alive. Um, that soil baking in the sun out there at 104 or 140, um, is not doing that type of stuff. And uh, I'll piggyback on that, Tom. Uh, there was a question way back um, in regards to, is, is there an online resource for ET specific to cover crops like there is for the other crop types? Not that I know of. And that was a question during Jeff and Anna, so maybe Jeff and Anna might yeah, and, and you know, if you, if you could, you could probably backdoor it, I guess, by, by taking a, taking your cover crop mix and say, okay, it's, it's, 
40 per, you know, and take a biomass sample and say, okay, it's 50% small grains, mostly oats or something like that, and 50% legumes, and go back and find an ET table for those products and say, okay, this is what this is doing, and then, you know, do some, some back of the envelope math and say, okay, this is kind of what's going on. Um, but as to whether it's actually coming off at the same rates as those calculations are, I, I can't say. Thank you. Okay, and I'm not sure if this question's already been answered in the chat, uh, but Tom, maybe you can touch more on this. Is there a difference between dew moisture collection by cover crop canopy and dew condensation on bare ground to mention? And I don't know if that would go more towards Jeff and, and Anna. Um, but I don't know if you have um, a basis on this question as well. I'm just going off of what, what information I've seen. So if you have a standing cover crop, again, you have bigger surface area for better, more dew collection. Now, how much of that dew makes it to the ground and then into the ground where it can be slowed down escaping, I don't know. Um, dew in California is usually fog. So bare ground is gonna have about as, as much applied to it as a fairly short cover crop would, in my opinion. Um, but then it's as the fog lifts, that, that dew is then evaporates back out into the atmosphere. So it's not necessarily adding to the soil moisture content. Okay, thank you, Tom. And um, looks like we have a five minute break. So we will resume. Um, so it looks like we finished a couple minutes early, but we could resume at 1030. And if and there, the, the chat has been really active with some back and forths with questions and answers, uh, we will have a formal question and answer que uh, session at the very end. So if at any time you've asked a question over the course of these presentations, please feel free to repost them at the very end if it did not get answered. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. It's 1030. So we'll begin. Um, we'll start our workshop again. Um, so next we have Silas Lasau with uh, California Act Solutions, who is covering detailed implementation and management strategies. So Silas, if you'd like to begin your presentation, that would be great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm going to be jumping in on uh, managing. Now, one of the key things that we'll kind of talk about is how much the principles in um, soil health are important rather than focusing on all the methods or the little practices that go on there. Um, I'll try to do my best to answer questions. I'll save some time, quite a bit of time at the end, so that we can answer a lot of those questions because there are so many varying conditions that we work with. Um, I think it's important to kind of answer those specific because up in Lodi is going to be different down in Bakersfield. So um, just a real quick background on who I am. Um, I also have Justin Dutro with me. He's um, part of our team. He's a PCA. And so he's going to talk a little bit about some of the other things that we run into um, as far as integrated pest management into our, our system of cover cropping. So um, we have been doing no-till and reduced tillage practices since about 2004 and uh, in various row crops. Now, and we had moved into more permanent crops in about 2014 and did a lot more cover cropping in almonds, pistachios, uh, walnuts, and grapes. So that's where we're going to spend most of our focus is uh, cover cropping in permanent systems. And we work with growers on large scales. So I appreciate all the work that uh, Jeff Mitchell has done in the past because he is um, instrumental in really getting the science and the details of how things are actually working. And then usually what we do as a company is we take that discovery research and then we bring it to grower results on a large scale. So we're working with um, 10,000, 15,000 and 500 acre, whatever size grower there is, we are trying to help them uh, become profitable with soil health techniques. So that is really one of the main things that we focus on is creating solutions that will improve soil health and increase overall farm prof profitability. Um, and one of the challenges with that is there are so many different um, operations that are out there, um, farming operations, uh, different management structures. Um, I come from a large farming uh, management background. Um, before I am, was the owner and operator here at California Ag Solutions, I managed a 15,000 acre um, farming operation where we had almonds, tomatoes, sugar beets, and a bunch of uh, forage crops for dairies, and that was the bulk of it. So alfalfa, winter forage, corn silage. Um, and I was really um, interested in how I could become more efficient. Um, that's one of the things I enjoy uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheets and how I can make things more efficient, more effective. Um, so I really enjoy looking at all these numbers. And that's something that I get to enjoy doing with growers all over the place now. And it has taught me a tremendous amount on how critical people are in every single operation. Um, you have guys um, that are in the field that really want to see things improve, and they are the critical um, impact that will make a cover cropping system effective and work. Um, I, that is probably one of the things I would like to probably have all of you remember if it was just one thing in this entire operation or in this uh, presentation is people are one of the most important components to making this successful. Uh, we need the right seed, the right uh, equipment, we need the right weather conditions, all those things are important, but people make the biggest difference in the sense of they will see something and they will be able to communicate through their little experience experiments uh, that they might have, even um, as a farm manager, you might not know about, uh, but that is extremely important is to have people that care. That is the thing that I have noticed is a common thread for all of our growers that are successful versus where we have failures. And believe me, there are failures looming at every corner, but it's how you recover from those failures, what you learn, and how we can um, prevent some of those things from happening again. So that is really kind of what we do as a company, uh, really working with people, creating the relationships and helping them succeed. Um, one of the ways that we have gained 
um, a lot of insight is really walking in the field and looking at what is out there. Um, if you're really paying attention to the crops that are growing, the soil, it's amazing how much um, nature tells you what's happening, um, how there's the perfect design in things. We just have to know how to manage it, how to work with it. Um, when I was first starting uh, my farm management career, um, one of the guys that I worked very closely with, um, he'd been doing it for a long time, very experienced, very knowledgeable. And uh, the comment that he made to me, it was probably the first few days that I was working with him. He said, one of the most important things that you can apply to a field is your shadow. And that meaning uh, spend time in the field, understand what's happening, um, go out there with a shovel, dig, look at it, and you will see things that will help you make decisions for the future. And that will give you the decision on how to manage little things, what piece of equipment might be needed, um, even what species are working well in your soil conditions, um, what soil amendments have done something. You know, there's a lot to see at a very small level uh, when you take the time to pay attention to all of these things. And I think um, this Bible passage speaks of that very clearly. Um, just pay attention to things and they will teach you. Uh, pay attention to all these little things and you'll be amazed how much we can learn in there. And I think that's one of the first starting points that I see with a lot of science that is out there is just paying attention to that. You get uh, curiosity and then you take that to the next level. So really uh, in summary of what all that is, is we're really trying to replicate the genius of nature. Um, and when we look at that and we start to see these patterns within um, our ecosystems that we are working with, specifically in the Central Valley, um, we start to see these five distinct principles of soil health. And I know you guys have probably heard these a million times, but why not? Let's hear it again. Um, I really look at following these principles. And that's one thing that is really important is looking at all of this as a principle-based system. Um, each one builds upon the other and helps the other one become successful. Um, when we look at this through the lens of cover cropping, it is extremely important to see how each one of these plays a critical role with soil armor, um, reducing the UV on the soil that completely changes soil temperature, how we can um, continue to increase soil organic matter. Um, minimizing disturbance is extremely important. And that's one of the things that we will talk about more towards the end of um, this presentation on how we manage um, and disturbance is something that can really help or maybe uh, really hinder what we're trying to do. Um, Tom mentioned a little bit of this in the last presentation about diversity. This is extremely important. Um, you know, if we're doing a monocrop cover crop, that's gets better than bare soil, obviously, but there's a lot that is lost because uh, we don't have that diversity. It's just like a well-oiled machine. Um, there's many different parts. You look at a very successful organization. Um, you have many different people. Uh, you have different people with backgrounds. You have different experiences. You have different abilities. Each one of those people bring a different skill set to the table. And that's really what makes um, companies great. Um, same thing with any organization. Uh, they need different backgrounds. And that's the same thing with plants. If we plant all the same thing, you pretty much feed that whole um, soil food web the same way and only certain things are successful. Uh, when you have diversity, you start to bring in a lot of other uh, sugars, carbohydrates, enzymes, proteins, um, everything flourishes because it feeds off of each other. The other thing is just uh, continual growing roots, uh, especially in these permanent crop systems, anything we can do to add, um, extra energy into the soil is critical, especially during dormant periods, um, especially for us in the Central Valley where that's when we get most of our rain is during the winter time. Uh, how can we store more of it so it doesn't wash off? Um, I have countless pictures on my phone of me taking a picture of the next door neighbor's field that was a bare floor. And then right next door, we have a cover crop in pistachios uh, that was no-till or almonds or walnuts, grapes, whatever it is. And there's no water standing in that field whatsoever. And they were able to capture absolutely everything. And in some situations, they were able to capture all the runoff from their neighbor's field and put it into their field as well. So I guess there's a double win for them. They're getting their neighbor's runoff um, to be able to leach a lot of the sodium and be able to build up their moisture profile. Um, 
Livestock integration. This is the one that is always the biggest, most challenging when we look at it from a uh, permanent crop system, especially in almonds. Um, but I will tell you, um, we have done that in almonds and it's been good. I wouldn't say we have 100% perfect success where we got 10,000 pounds per acre, but there's some interesting things that we have seen with that. So if you guys want, I can uh, answer questions about that later too. Um, uh, some of these benefits you guys have obviously heard from some of these other presentations, but I'm just going to, um, I'll skip over a lot of these because you guys obviously know that because each one of these benefits uh, interests an operation differently than maybe their next door neighbor. We, each operation that we work with has so many different challenges and different um, focuses that they're trying to improve so that they can improve their overall farm profitability. And when you really look at farm sustainability, it's making sure that they have the ability to continue to take care of the soil year after year. Um, so sustainability really has a lot to do with profitability. Um, they should be hand in hand. So when we look at a lot of these things, these are things that we look at on each operation. And these are just some of them, maybe the top 10, 11, that a lot of people will see and that we get feedback from growers. So now with all of that, we also have concerns with everything. And a lot of these concerns um, we address, and this is where we start to get into some of the management of this presentation. Um, each one of these, we have to change our management strategy with growers. And so it can get very overwhelming when you start looking at um, operations that might be limited on equipment, might be limited on staff, uh, might be limited on water. There's all these limiting factors to what we might have in a different area. So when we go into an operation and start working with people, we really um, try to do an evaluation of, and kind of a overall just approach where we're asking a lot of questions. We want to learn, we want to understand what is it that each um, operation might have a concern with? What are their top three challenges that they're trying to work with? Um, and certain cover crop species, certain cover crop mixes and timing of stuff really changes what we would look at. Water infiltration might be one focus, whereas somebody else might have salinity. Obviously, those most likely are always related, but there's a lot of other opportunities for us to look at what can we work with them on. Um, and that's something that I can jump into. Um, and if you guys are interested, I love going into the field with people and getting to see their operation. That is probably one of the most important things that I can do with growers is being in the field with them uh, to answer those questions. And a lot of that um, is the same thing that Justin does. Um, I'm going to hand it over to him. He's going to talk about just what we've seen and some of the things that he's seeing specifically firsthand. Hello, everybody. Really have enjoyed all the presentations so far. Um, as here's some of my observations that I've seen. Um, we are finding that with our growers who implement cover crops and orchard systems, we're, we're finding reductions in inputs such as water, fertilizer, and pesticides. Uh, we're getting increases in bio, biocontrol. So biocontrol is one of my favorite classes in, in college. And I had my professor tell me years ago, if it wasn't for the natural biocontrols we had working for us in the field, we'd have to spray every day. And that's something that's just impossible that we'd never be able to do it. We would not be able to farm without the natural biocontrols. So on one ranch, employing cover crops in multiple fields, had over 70% of the leaves that I was randomly pulling, checking for mites, I would, I would find a predatory mite on those leaves. So I was curious, I looked at the neighbors that is literally right across the creek. And, you know, I had a hard time even finding predatory mites. You know, maybe 10% maybe of leaves had a predatory mite. So for IPM implications, cover crops can be hosts for beneficial insects. They can be hosts for pests and soil microorganisms. Cover crops can lead to increased nutrient efficiency, decreased phytophthora pressure, and increased water infiltration. And that's, uh, that's actually the same almond field that I was finding um, all the predatory mites in. Increased levels of beneficials that are known to be associated with cover crops, parasitoids, predatory mites, ladybird beetles, and many more. You have a habitat there, you've increased the habitat for those beneficial uh, insects, and then you have a food source for them too. So 
you are taking care of your biocontrols. Thanks, Justin. Um, so now I'm going to jump into a little bit of the uh, nuts and bolts of what we have seen that is, I guess you could say, most effective on managing things. And remember, these are principles that we're going after and the individual methods or practices may vary from operation to operation. So I just want you guys to um, see this from a high level and then we can jump into specifics. And the reason I chose um, almonds in this is they're probably one of the most difficult um, permanent crops to manage because of the um, on-ground harvest. So you're shaking the almond, falls on the ground, it has to dry out, you pick it up. Um, that is a challenge, whereas pistachios and what we've been doing, um, it is a completely different management strategy, um, more towards the summer and harvesting. Um, it's actually easier with pistachios from what we found. There's different challenges and problems, but I just figured I'd pick almonds uh, just to be um, challenged here. Um, one of the, the most important things that I have seen with all of that uh, cover crop selection, what species, legumes, forbs, um, grasses, all of the different ones. There's mainly four main categories um, that we play with. And underneath those, you have countless other species. So what we're looking at here is really the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And when you're looking at that, that has a lot to do with how quickly that residue is going to break down. And for almonds, that's obviously very important. So there's different management strategies that we've seen with mowing. Um, we like to probably look at two to three mows in the beginning of the year, um, that last mow usually being in that July timeframe. But we've even pushed mowing out a um, little bit later. But one of the key things that we look at is the type of mower that we use the very first um, and the second type of mow and the third mow typically are slightly different setups at slightly different heights. So when we usually start, and I'm being very general here to kind of cover um, almonds that are up north to almonds that are all the way down south in Kern and Bakersfield area. So the key things that we're looking at is the height of that cover crop that we are mowing is extremely important. That first mow that we're doing um, sometimes around the beginning of April um, is actually a pretty high mow. We're leaving about six to nine inches of that cover crop left. And then we're usually using a rotary type mower um, kind of like those mowers that you see on the side of the highway that mow, a uh, big giant lawnmower looking thing. That is fairly effective. And when you look at how much you can mow for the, the speed, the labor, and the diesel consumption, that's probably one of the most effective ways to just knock down a cover crop. Because as these cover crops get closer to flowering and into that fruit fill or the grain fill, whatever that seed is filling, that carbon to nitrogen ratio significantly changes very quickly. Um, that carbon really shoots up and that nitrogen really is reduced within the plant. That really slows down that plant's ability to be decomposed. And that really is one of our key things that we're looking at here. We're trying to find the ideal balance between that plant um, decomposing and still providing a little bit of habitat and mulch up there. Now, the key thing that I want everyone to remember, and I know a lot of you know this already, but soil microbes eat first. They will devour any of the nutrients that are in the soil. They will take care of themselves before the plant is taken care of. Um, one of the key things that we look at here is how do we best manage the microbes in this situation? How do we feed them so that they don't disrupt the system? Going back to principle number two, it's key that we make sure these guys are happy because they're the ones doing all the heavy lifting. If I shock a system and have an extremely high carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, feedstock or some of the residue that we're mowing that's extremely, uh, let's just say it's a lot of grasses, mainly say wheats or barleys or whatever that grass might be, that carbon to nitrogen ratio, especially if it's reached full maturity or even close to maturity, that carbon is like 60 to 1, 80 to 1. So it's going to steal nitrogen out of the system. Um, and when we have this happening, that's probably around that March, April, May timeframe. There's a lot of nitrogen 
that will be pulled out of the system and it can cause nitrogen deficiency within the crop, your cash crop. So it's critical how we manage that and the timing of everything and particle size. That's the other important thing with carbon to nitrogen ratios is it's not just this, the product or the residue itself, but it's also how small do you make that material? If I've uh, turned that material into really fine particles, I have a lot more surface area. I have a lot more microbial activity that can break that down. I have it a lot more touching the soil surface. Um, that is what causes some major disturbances in these systems where the residue is broken down. Um, if I leave too large of a particle size, then everything really is uh, very slow to break down because of whether it's off the ground, whether it is uh, touching other plants where it does not uh, have the surface area to be exposed to other soil microbes, uh, that will really slow it down. So there is a happy medium there and that has a lot to do with the type of mower and the types of blades. Those of you guys who are familiar with different um, flail mowers, you guys know that there are two different types of blades. There's more of an L-shaped blade on the inside and then there's also more of a cupped blade. Uh, each one of those has a purpose. Um, the L-shaped blades are far more efficient as far as fuel consumption. You can speed up and go quite a bit faster, and it leaves larger particle sizes. That's a great thing to do maybe after that rotary mower, but when you're looking at finishing up the uh, cover crop and really scalping it down to the soil surface so that you can terminate most of it, and you can also start to get a very clean orchard floor, you want to use those cupped blades in the uh, flail mower. That really decreases particle size and it will help um, keep everything smaller so that anything that you do have left can be blown through a pickup machine um, far better than large pieces of material that can blow out and pick up nuts on the same way out. So, Particle size is extremely important, and that's something that's good. So one of the things that we shoot for, that we're targeting, is you see that 24 to 1. That is the ideal number that soil microbes um, prefer. They love that in their diet. So right here, you guys kind of see something real simple, uh, just a simple chart that goes through the different ratio ratios. If it's obviously too high of a number, you see all those straws, stovers, um, that can be something if we let things go too far, it will take too long for it to break down. Um, when it is smaller, that's, or the smaller number, the 10 to 1, 11 to 1, all those, that's a pretty quick breakdown and that becomes a nitrogen uh, increase in that system. Um, so a lot of the compost that we work with and we see, whether it's green waste or if it's dairy or if it's blended of the two, eh, eight to 12 is around that range that we see of carbon to nitrogen. And so that's what helps add nitrogen to that system and actually helps break down a lot of these higher uh, straws or the higher uh, carbon material that we do have in a cover crop. So. One of the key things that we look at here and how we balance a um, mix and picking certain species is really looking at um, what is our natural um, vegetation that's there, what's done well, um, how do we, and then how do we kind of manipulate where we want the crop to be. Uh, we try to mix quite a bit of um, grasses with legumes, broadleafs, and brassicas. Uh, when we have these mixes, we're Sometimes we're a little bit heavier on grasses, maybe a little bit lighter on legumes. I like to be heavier on legumes, but unfortunately, a lot of our soil is very um, saline sodic, which does not promote a lot of legume growth. Uh, it's usually a little bit harder. So finding the right species in there is critical. Um, we've been doing this for a while and we're always learning something new every year and uh, getting that right blend works well. Um, that's obviously the most important part when we start to uh, make a plan. Um, but it's interesting because I can play, plant the same species, the same percent mix um, every two weeks uh, during the winter time and every single year. And it will look slightly different every single time I've planted it. And when I put it in different soil situations, it will start to look different as well. So uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, you can have a great plan, but you know, 
the way weather works, it will change that for you. Soil moisture is critical in what species are going to thrive. And that's something that's changing constantly, especially when we have a year like this compared to a year like last year. That makes it interesting. Um, I think that is a lot of what I look at and it's so important with all of these uh, balancing the carbon nitrogen ratio and particle size. There's a lot to that. So we talked a little bit about that, obviously, but that is another very important part to everyone's success um, or failure um, is really managing that mower and having a guy that pays attention that can manage other guys that say, hey, this is the height that we need to be set at. This is the speed. Um, paying attention to those little details really helps. Um, and the other fun thing is when we look at these species, we're also, uh, as I mentioned, we're kind of going six to nine inches on that first mow. You will start to have a completely different looking cover crop that starts to appear after that. And that cover crop that you have there also will have a different carbon to nitrogen ratio as it grows. We've seen a lot of these clovers and legumes really recover well, and some of these um, other grasses will do well. And so uh, they will have a much lower carbon to nitrogen ratio on that second mowing as well as the third. Um, that changes things. So we are picking species that purposely recover differently than say, um, just trying to manage the first cover crop. It really is managing multiple cover crops and what this will look like after we mow it the second and third time and also making sure that we can terminate it at the right amount of time as well. Um, this kind of draws to the end that I really want, um, going back to these principles and what we're trying to achieve um, versus the methods. And I think this quote really sums that up uh, to help people see that, you know, if we're always focused on the methods, we're <laughs> gonna get frustrated and we're gonna have a lot of trouble. But when you really have the principles in mind and you're focusing on the right success and have that desire to be uh, inquisitive and have the right people in those positions that are gonna help um, create new solutions, that is gonna be one of the key things that makes this successful or not. Uh, we have seen this time and time again where someone goes into this um, saying this isn't gonna work and they're 100% right because they don't have the attitude where they want to make it work. Um, there will be some challenges, um, even for somebody who's been doing it for a long time. They're still gonna run into something that they've never experienced before, but it's how well do they pick themselves up and keep moving on and figuring it out and really creating a network. And that's one of the key things that we try to encourage with our growers is having them communicate directly with other growers who've been doing this as well because it is critical that they have a support network that helps them uh, through these challenges. And that's what we try to facilitate, uh, putting the right growers together. A lot of times I'll, I'll have a grower with me in my truck. We will go to another grower's place. I will not need to say anything. I let the two growers talk and they learn more from each other than I ever could uh, communicate to them. So I think that's really a fun, but also a humbling thing because there's a lot to be learned out there. So if you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Um, here's Justin and I, uh, our contact info. If you guys want to email us or call us, even send us a text. So I think if you guys want, ask away. So it looks like there's a few questions in the chat. Uh, let's see here. So we have, um, when planting almonds on a new piece of land, do you plant the cover crops at the same time or do you wait a year or two? Um, good question. So I farm as well um, and I've established almonds and different stages and I would prefer in most situations um, planting cover crop right away um, and just getting that moving, getting that ball going. Um, let's say you've got, you're bringing in all depends on if you're going to be bare root or potted, however you plan to do that. Um, having a cover crop even to drive on is extremely important because who knows what the spring is going to look like. And I'd much rather be driving over my cover crop that's been established to help support um, all the traffic that will be going through there rather than uh, just bare dirt than planting afterwards. My soil structure is more important to me than the beauty that my cover crop will be. Thank you, Silas. And there's one more question. Um, how does the food safety law work when animals are used in almond orchards? 
Great question. I saw Mark ask that one. Um, so the way that this has worked, um, these growers have worked directly with the holer. Um, the holer has looked at it and they have not had any issues when they've sampled it. Um, we're usually trying to pull that animal off um, in uh, late March, um, sometimes mid-March, but our key thing is uh, making sure that there's nothing left out there. Uh, sheep do a pretty good job of eating malva, which is awesome. Um, you don't have to manage it as hard, but uh, we do have to make sure that we've got the right environment. We do, do have some rain to break that down and making sure that we don't have any um, feces that's out there that's in piles. Um, it's been very successful as far from that standpoint of not having um, any residue uh, left from animals. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Tyler. And mm -hmm. if anybody has any additional questions, um, please feel free to type it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, but I do not see any additional questions, so we can move on to the next presenter. Um, thank you, Silas, for your presentation. Uh, we will move next to Karen Lowell uh, with NRCF. Good morning, everyone. Um, Looks like somebody else is sharing a screen. Is that right, Amy? Or can I share now? Uh, you should be able to now. Hi. So good morning, everyone. And um, gosh, we've already had so many good presentations that I am um, challenged to add a terrific amount to what you've already been offered. So I'm going to back clean up here and try to return us to, as Silas so eloquently pointed out, the principles. Because really, the devil is in the details. And that's your ground, your operation, your equipment, your tolerance for something other than a beautiful billiard table with trees sticking out of it. These are all the sort of really personal and site-specific decisions that um, are needed, um, you know, information about your specific situation is what you need to guide you through it. I hey, often Karen. think of- Hey Karen, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, your presentation, we're able to see your um, your comments in your notes. Oh, there, how's that? Let's see, perfect. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. Keep, keep moving. Apologies. Um, so I often think of farming ventures as sort of risk management. You're managing a crop, you're managing water, you're managing nutrients, you're managing pests, you're managing a million things, but each of them have their own risk factors. And any change, I often think about it like a spider web, anything that moves in a spider web shakes everything else. And so a lot of what I talk about with producers when we're talking about adding or changing cover crop um, application in their system is what's your plan to monitor and pay attention to what else might be changing that you didn't anticipate. So I just wanted to start out with that um, as a as a as a core foundational principle when you're thinking about including how to make cover crops work for you. Um, there's also one other thing that I saw pop up in the um, chat, and I just want to make sure everybody is clear about this. Um, NRCS, the agency I work for, Natural Resources Conservation Service, we do, as you heard, and as many of you probably know offer financial assistance to eligible growers to help offset the cost of adopting cover crop in your systems. And there was a concern that if you were to work with us and go ahead and do the cover crop and then we didn't get rain and the cover crop failed that you would be out the cost of the seed. And I just wanted to clarify that we create uh, what we call an implementation requirement, which just means that it's the, it's the specifics of how you are agreeing to establish the crop. We do not require irrigation. Um, and we do allow things like early mowing um, to mitigate the water use if you have a cover crop and the rains stop early. Um, or if your objective is to maximize infiltration, but not necessarily to maximize biomass of that cover crop. So I just please ask me later or your local NRCS planner. But just to be clear, if God does not see fit to give us water some year, but you have planted and prepared as you agreed to in the implementation requirements, which you review, 
um, then you would still be eligible for that payment. And I will also say that, you know, we do have um, guidelines that we must follow with regard to what species are approved for use in an implementation that uses our financial assistance. But what we're avoiding are things that are exotic invasives or for some reason considered an escape risk for adjacent natural lands and that kind of thing, or there's not an expectation that they will perform well. That said, there are um, channels through which a variance can be requested. So if you're working with Tom or Silas or your CCA, your PCA, and you have a particular species that you're interested in planting and your conservation planner with NRCS doesn't come up with that one, please raise that as, um, you know, an interest that you want to pursue that because there are people like me who can elevate a variance and um, provided there is not a concern about an unintended adverse impact, those can be approved. So I just want to highlight the critical nature of getting insight from local resources, like some of whom you've just heard from. Okay, so I'm going to kind of loop back around um, to some of the foundational principles. Um, so thank you, Silas, you booted it up beautifully. And you heard from uh, Jeff and Anna and, um, and Tom, you know, just thinking about what are you trying to do to maintain and support the critical ecological functions of the soil in your production system. First off, you wanna keep the soil in place and cover crops do a beautiful job of that. You want to maintain beneficial components in the soil, so carbon, nutrients, things like that, and avoid accumulation of problematic things, salts and things like that. And what we're really aiming for in building and maintaining our soils is to allow them to continue to function in our ecosystems in the ways we need them to, so that we all can um, get the food and fiber we need in our production systems. So storing and cycling, water, nutrients, carbon, all of those are critical roles for the soil matrix. Obviously they plant, they support the plants, they filter and buffer. One of the reasons that you don't see, um, we have regulatory processes to guard against things moving to groundwater that are concerning if we then drink that groundwater, but we would have a heck of a lot more down there if it wasn't passing through the soil. The soil is an incredible capacity to filter and buffer what moves through it. Yeah, um, diverse soil biology, many important medicines, um, antagonistic organisms to plant disease organisms that may be in the soil, all of that diverse biology is incredibly important. So one thing I like to do when talking to, um, you know, growers is acknowledge that there's an awful lot of discussion in the public at large with regard to the soil and sequestering carbon. And I think it's helpful to have a reality check. We can, as Jeff's research has shown and as other research has shown, we can really significantly improve the carbon levels in our soil. Um, but there are some realities that we need to pay attention to. And this is a graphic that just sort of captures that, and I won't go into it in great detail, just to say that there are soil factors that influence how much um, soil uh, carbon is likely to accumulate in soils. Those are sort of hard and fast factors. Now, I'm not saying you can't build carbon in any soil. I'm just saying that it's important to keep that in mind. Likewise, there are climate factors. And then there's the management factors and those we are in full control of, how we manage the ground, just work looking at reducing tillage, that disruptive process of tillage really sets us back when we're trying to hold on to carbon in our systems and some of those functions. So I, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying we can't build organic carbon in our soils. I just wanna remind us that um, we are challenged in our, um, in our region to achieve some of the things that we see in, from other regions. And that's okay, we are what we are and um, that's all I wanted to say about that. So let's talk about manage. We're talking about cover crops today and they really are a workhorse. I often joke if I could only keep one of our conservation practices, I think it might be cover crops because they really do, they are the Swiss army knife of um, conservation practices. All these things here that you see, and you've heard a lot about this from speakers earlier, so I won't, I won't um, 
belabor this. But some of these things I do from the questions, I do want to say a few things. In terms of weed suppression, I'll, I'll mention that Eric Brennan, who does the cover crop research over here on the coast, and if you haven't found his YouTube videos, you really should. Um, they're highly entertaining and super, super valuable. Um, but he has found that if you want to aim for weed suppression, this is one of those devils in the details, you really need to consider seeding. He'll seed at two or three times the recommended rate if he's looking to smother some weeds. And I know there are some fields he was dealing with nutsedge, which is a real bear. Um, so he's really wrestled with it. And that's something that you might need to experiment with in your system. Um, all right, so I was asked to talk about sort of the water and the nutrient management um, considerations that might be important when thinking about adding cover crops to your management system. I think we've covered them pretty robustly. So I'm gonna move fairly quickly and try to leave us time for you to ask things that are important for you in your systems, because that really is where we're gonna to get to some um, nuts and bolts. So you've heard a lot about this, this uh, the role that cover crops have in helping the soils perform uh, optimally with regard to their role in the hydrologic cycle. So you've seen some good data on how they can really help maximize infiltration. They build soil organic matter. When you have solid soil organic matter, you maintain good aggregate structure and you can capture and hold plant available water more effectively. Um, so I have a plus in the infiltration. They may, as you've heard, they may have some evapotranspiration use, right? They use some water, but you saw data from Jeff and Anna. It's not as concerning as some um, sort of, if you only thought about it in, in theory, it might be very concerning, but we're gonna talk a little bit about management and how you might mitigate the concerns that that might have. Um, evaporative losses and runoff, you can get infiltration data, and there is some of that, and I'll show you some of that in a minute, and you can estimate evapotranspiration water use, as you've seen today. Getting a solid handle on evaporation loss and runoff loss um, is a little bit less direct. I've been working with Amelie Garin, and Jeff is in that research group as well, as I'm sure I, I, I'm assuming you are, Anna. Um, and many others, but she has some funding to look at um, cover crop systems. And the, I asked her, I said, could you help us capture not just the infiltration, but also what water loss was avoided by having that cover on the ground? Because that might change that balance sheet of water use um, that makes people concerned about cover crop a little more favorable. So I, I think we've all talked about this and I won't belabor the point, but um, just a graphic really illustrating why is it so important to keep that surface protected. If you want to maximize what goes into the surf, into the ground, you really need to keep that surface structure open, as you see on the left. And if you don't have surface protection um, in the form of mulch or a growing plant, then the fine components of the soil matrix sort of sort themselves up and seal that surface. And that's when you start to lose the opportunity to infiltrate water. So just a quick graphic to put some images to that. One of the things that I talk a lot about is uh, avoiding allowing perfection to be the enemy of progress. Um, this is some quick data from some of my colleagues who just uh, did, a, did a quick study looking at differences in how well the ground takes water in different systems. So when you till that soil on the far left, you see the infiltration rate, it's a half an inch an hour. You can't get the water down. Even if you just have some sparse resident vegetation, whatever happens to be growing there, you let it grow rather than disking, maybe you mow it. Um, you can significantly improve that water infiltration. And of course, when you get a good robust stand of cover crop, you really maximize what you put down into that ground. I don't have um, a slide for this, but I'll just mention, you all know our uh, rainfall patterns are changing and we get m less frequent, more intense storms. Uh, where I am right now, we got five inches in the last two days. We didn't used to get it that way. And that means that the ground has to be ready to take water. 
keeping a living root in the ground is basically like having tunnels into the soil to hold that water whenever God sees fit to give it to us. So thinking about water use in your cover crops, it's really important to also think about what will they help me avoid losing? How do we maximize capturing whatever we get? So one thing that came up earlier, and I did happen to already have this slide, so I just wanted to touch on it. Um, somebody asked about dew moisture collection by the cover crop canopy. And I will show you in a minute, this um, image on the top is from um, a, a publication that UC Davis, Almond Board, and I, gosh, I'll show you in a minute, but another entity put together thinking about best management practices for cover crops in almonds. And somebody asked about how's it different on the dew collection from bare ground versus um, something with vegetation. The picture on the bottom there is from our plant material center in Lockford. And we were out there last week doing a training and there had been a lot of fog. And the dry, um, we've done this training there a number of times, usually when it's not likely to rain. So the ground is very dry. And usually water goes into that grassy area there in the front um, readily. And the tilled area, it doesn't go in hardly at all. Well, interestingly, when we were out there last time, what we found was that grassy area had received so much, captured so much water from the dew that it was actually pretty wet, whereas that dry area was pretty dry. And we looked down, it's always good. I always, always, always say, take a shovel and dig. Um, there are lots of fancy things you can do to look at your soil, but take a shovel and dig. And what we found was that there was this platy layer that impeded movement down. And so that surface horizon in that, that's actually a sort of a volunteer cover crop weed um, stand that came up because the rain came early, but it's vegetation. And it really just captured a lot of that moisture that the dry ground did not. So to the answer to the question is my observation last week was, yeah, that really helped capture whatever we got in whatever form, dew or rainfall. But, you know, there's, I won't repeat the headlines, they make us all shiver, um, but, you know, water availability is a factor for management decisions um, in an operation. So this is some data just showing as that green line goes up, that's the cover crop starting to use some water. So um, as Jeff and Anna said, maybe it's not quite as bad as, as, as we might assume, but it is a consideration. So what do we do to maximize the value of cover crops and minimize any potential downsides. And I just wanna to flag too, cover crops can look lots of different ways, right? Like they, they may be very robust, they may be low growing, they may be um, trunk to trunk, they may be a strip in the middle, anything you get on there is going to have benefits on the ground on which it grows. So this is some data, just food for thought. Um, this is from the coast and I don't, it's a busy slide. You don't need to get lost in all the details. What I really want you to notice is the A and the B in pink and yellow. The A shows you that when rye, which was grown in the furrow bottoms, and it was killed super early. Those bottom pictures are when it was killed. It was knocked down with glyphosate. Um, so the root channel remained, right? So the above ground portion was dead, but it remained as a mulch and the root channel remained intact. And so even when you did that, and that's all it looked like, the benefit to capturing rainfall and avoiding runoff is shown between A and B. So on bare ground, they lost nearly 50% of the water on that, I'll call it a wimpy little cover crop, um, they were able to capture enormous amount of rainfall. So food for thought, when you're thinking about how to manage your ground and maximize benefits, keep in mind, there are ways to manage that might mitigate your concerns. Um, and also there are other ways you might think about this. You wouldn't necessarily have to knock it all the way down. And one of those ways, like I said, you might choose something that isn't quite as much biomass. Now, if you're looking to build soil carbon, um, or grow enough of one of the brassicas to have a fumigant 
impact, well, this probably won't do it for you, right? So again, it's critical to think about what are your management objectives, and then you work backwards from there, working with people like your RCDs and RCS, um, Tom and Silas, your CCAs, whole raft, Jeff, a raft of people can help you think about how do I maximize the benefits and minimize the downside. Again, really busy data, and this is some of Jeff's earlier work, and the, what I wanted to take away from this, I tried to color code it so your brains don't explode, but what I wanted to flag here is every year is different, right? And so there's a blue year and a red year. The rainfall patterns were different, so the cover crop growth was different, and the soil moisture content under those cover crops was different. The point here isn't necessarily to untangle all of this data. The point here is to recognize that management will require that you're paying attention each year and not assuming that what happened one year will happen again the next year. And again, I come back to pay attention and put your shadow on your field, as Silas said. Um, there are, again, lots of ways you might manage so you maximize the benefits. You don't have to put it in every row. Maybe you put it in every other row. Maybe you plant one row in the early season, one row later in the season. Uh, choose a species that doesn't create as much biomass if it's a concern. How are you going to mow it? When are you going to mow it? Those are all things that you can fiddle with to maximize benefit and minimize concerns that you may have in your particular scenario. They are, again, now I'll just kind of quickly segue to the um, nutrient management considerations. Um, again, they're a workhorse there, and you've heard enough about it. So I don't really want to um, belabor this point. Really, what you're doing and when uh, Jeff alluded to the work that we did over here on the coast to help Region 3 Water Board understand why we were so keen to incentivize cover crops. And I was part of the group that offered testimony and, and, and drafted a uh, letter for them. And they're actively doing research now to continue to inform that um, allowance in the Water Board and the monitoring and reporting and nitrogen use re uh, requirements. And what we were trying to help them understand is that cover crops can kind of, it's not just how much nitrogen you put on, it's also where is it in your system? The trick is keeping it above the leaching hazard zone. And that's really where cover crops can help in our veg crop systems here. You've heard a lot about, and it is critical to think about management of your um, legumes if you're intending to bring nitrogen into your system. And I, I am going to show you where this resource that I've pulled several things from resides, but lots of things to think about um, terminating for um, terminating your cover crop. You want to think about what is your purpose of the cover crop? If it's um, to bring some nitrogen in with some legumes, then you want to think about terminating before it um, starts to decrease its nitrogen um, content. Um, you also want to think about as Silas alluded, will it break down in the time frame? And then Jeff has pointed out, and this is a really good um, thought. I haven't seen it done much, um, but it's a great idea: is to leave your mow, leave your mow it, so it's no longer using water, but leave it as a surface mulch. Surface mulch is fantastic for a lot of purposes and really keeping your soil functioning well. So I'm I'm kind of closing, coming to my close here. This is, these are questions some colleagues and I, when we work with a customer who wants to think about doing cover crops with our assistance, my job is to help my colleagues ask you, the producers, um, the right questions so that I can help put together a, um, a plan that makes sense. So the very first thing that I need to know is why does somebody want to plant a cover crop? Because that's going to give me a lot of information about what are good species, when might they plant, how might they terminate, et cetera. When do you want it growing? And when do you need to get on it? Somebody alluded to, you know, if you need to get on ground when it might be wet, if you've got a good robust root system in the ground, you can get on that ground without getting stuck. Um, and if you, maybe you don't want something that's three feet tall, maybe you want to keep it lower growing. So thinking about what are your operational needs is really important. Um, how much biomass do you want? If you're maximizing carbon, then you want that biomass, but then you got to think about, well, how am I going to terminate it? Um, somebody was asking about different ways to kill things that don't involve tillage. 
you know, if you have something, uh, Eric Brennan loves the mustards because he says they're just so easy to kill. So talk to your seed person, talk to your CTA, you know, share ideas. Well, I planted this, it was great. Drove over it, it was dead. Mowed it once, it was dead. Some things you can roll or, roll or crimp them, but they bounce back up. You know, so you want to you want to get some um, some knowledge and some experience into your fold as you make the decision about what you're going to plant. Um, and then, of course, there are some unique things you might be trying to deal with. If you've got a compacted layer and you want to try to break that up and open it up, you're, there are some species you might select that have a good, strong root structure to poke through that a little bit better, et cetera. So lots and lots of things, disease and pest pressure. You've heard some of that about it. I, I, I've been after the IPM group for a while saying, can you please help us like create a, a clearinghouse where as people, even if it's just anecdotal, because I have anecdotal experience, but I'd like to see it at least compiled somewhere so we can look at it and you can um, make your decisions about whether it's evidence you want to act upon or not. But at least let's try to tr start to capture that. Um, so I think that's what I'd like to stop with and let um, folks ask what they want to ask at this point, Amy. And so I will stop sharing. And I, uh, I do like the Swiss Army knife uh, analogy for cover crops. And I, um, I think you heard that today. So I'll stop sharing, Amy, and go back to you. Thank you, Karen. It looks like we have a few questions in the chat. Um, so I could read them off to you. Let's see here. So we have, I may have missed it. This is uh, Danielle Zachariah during the previous presentation, but in cover cropped fields, the salt leaching practices may be much more effective and efficient than in bare ground farmland. Can anyone provide information on this key aspect? And the following question uh, for that is similar with which cover crop species would be best for managing and or tolerating soil salinity. So if any of our panelists have I, any answers I, on this. I will address um, Richard's work that I showed you with that really minimal, um, anything that will maximize infiltration is gonna maximize leaching the salts, right? Um, and we do have, uh, NRCS uses something that um, all the species that we typically would use in a practice, you can search there and find species that are particularly tolerant of salts. And I'd be happy to show that to folks um, at some point. And I did, if you don't mind, I wanted to show, I forgot to show this and I really do want to, um, where did it go? Um, the, um, this is, nope, no, not the document, where's the document? This is the document that I referenced um, that the Almond Board, UC Davis, um, oh, and UCA and R. So both of the UC resources. Oops, am I sharing a name? Looks like you're sharing like a recent files. So I think you have to open it and share share the document itself. It says I'm sharing screen. Let me try again. I really encourage people to find this. Um, where is it? I apologize. I have no idea why it's not sharing. Anyway, I will drop it in the chat. Um, it's a document that just would be a good thing to refresh a lot of what we've talked about today if you're thinking about adding cover crops to your system and it just helps you systematically remember, oh yeah, I got to think about that. Um, not that most practitioners aren't going to do that, but it does maybe remind you that you want to ask Silas something or Tom something or your NRCS planner or your RCD planner. It just reminds you that you want to touch on those things. 
Okay, and it looks like there's another, there's a few questions. Should we worry about evaporation via capillary action in cover crops that have been terminated but not integrated? Jeff, do, is Jeff still on? Because I'm wondering if he wants to address the value of the surface mulch with that regard. Let's see, I don't know if Jeff is still on, but maybe Anna could speak to that question if she's available. Uh, Jeff is still on, he just dropped out as a panelist. I think I just unmuted him if he can unmute himself. Yeah. Okay, so there, if you can hear me, there, there's a lot going on uh, under this question here. Um, what happens when a bare soil dries? Let's say there was rain, like we had rain today. Eventually, probably within, if we don't get any more rain, that's, that soil is going to dry within 24 or 48 hours. So once that surface drying occurs, generally what has been found is that uh, there's not a lot of, there is some capillary movement upward toward the drying uh, atmosphere, that's true, but this the soil surface, when it is dry, it serves somewhat as a barrier to further evaporation. So after a certain short-term period, maybe 24, 48 hours, there's not an awful lot of evaporation that's going to happen. There is some, and that's, that's indisputable, but it, it's minimized greatly. So what happens under a covered situation where you have what Karen was talking about and others this morning about the, the mulch, you actually have a protective layer that does a number of things, including reducing the temperature, as Daniele has said in the chat there, reducing the energy that gets to the soil surface to evaporate additional water. So that's one thing. Uh, and, and it's protecting also. It's protecting in terms of wind, uh, the boundary layer, uh, gets protected there. So you're not going to have all of those other energy forces that are going to be apt or susceptible to, to further evaporating water. So, you know, you know, we don't consider these kind of things. I'm speaking generally here in California that, you know, we're not that so far it hasn't come to the extent where it has in other areas where they have, have only been able to rely on rainfall for, for, uh, crop production water. But if you go to certain areas of the world, and I mentioned the Dakotas, you know, it, the story is back in the 1990s, farmers were literally going out of business. They were going bankrupt because they could only grow a crop one year. Then they had to what is called summer fallow. They had to wait till the third year, the next year, when they would conserve enough water just by fallowing the ground in between. And it was a dead end. They were not they were not economically viable at that point. So they learned about residue preservation. They learned about reduced disturbance. They learned about the value of surface residues. And they now are able to, to a large extent, intensify and diversify the cropping systems that they have. Now, we're thankfully far from that situation in most regions of California. And, you know, to be frankly and, frankly and honest right here, when we did that article where we showed 13% water savings or the equivalent of four or five inches in a summer period, I thought that would be very important. I thought that would get some attention and, you know, be a, a newsworthy finding and coming out of science there. But, you know, the management of these systems to, to grow crops in residues, to handle all the ancillary issues, including you know, risks of threat, uh, of pest issues, and it's not easy. So all, all of that needs to be sorted out. But thankfully, there are a lot of people that are quite keen now uh, in, in the fact that this webinar is going on, and we're talking about these things is very encouraging. So I've given a very long answer there, Amy, but it's an important concept. And there's a lot that we have to, to do on this, this whole thing there. Thank you, Jeff. That was a great answer. Um, we, it looks like we have another question in the Q&A. Um, so what type of cover crop species in vineyards during a drought season are recommended? And maybe you, Jeff, or um, Karen can address this, or Silas as well, and Tom. No, mate, let's turn it over maybe to Tom and Silas, I think, because they're, they're the, the species and the mixtures and the thing. I, 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 what do you guys think? 
I'm sorry, um, I was I was out. So, um, what was the question? They're looking for so species suggestions or recommendations for vineyards in in particularly in water short situations. Then I, then I have to break it out in, in, in what they're trying to accomplish. If they're just looking for a general cover crop, I would usually go um, with something that's fairly early maturing and not particularly tall growing. And then, okay, are you just gonna mow it and drive on it all summer? Or are you gonna disc it in? Or are you looking for something else in particular? So dry, dry land vineyard, and as somebody else pointed out earlier, it's like, yeah, we're irrigating, the, we're irrigating the vines, we're not irrigating the middles. So um, we want to save water, but we have to have water. So that's the reason I would go with something early maturing. Um, barley comes to mind. A lot of times that's kind of the number one used on the central coast that I'm aware of. It, it does the job and, and it matures early enough that they can mow it off and, and it just lays there all summer. And, and there's not enough left come fall that they have to worry too much about it. Um, if they're looking for soil improvement, yeah, you'd add legumes. Uh, a lot of vineyards are not necessarily on, on soils that are to limit legumes. You, and if you're planting a planting a large seed mix, you know, you're using barley or oats and baba beans and peas and maybe vetch. Um, if they're looking for something that they want short, low growing, drive on, erosion protection, you usually lean real heavy on annual grasses like blandos and zoros, which are semi-native annual grasses and annual ryegrass and then it's usually got some clover in it just to increase the, the nitrogen content in the top growth those are managed so that they're they bloom and they make seed um, you can usually mow them fairly early but if you mow them right about the time they're blooming you're not going to see them ever again and you're just managing it to reseed itself um, so that that kind of divides up how I would, how I, the questions I ask when somebody says, ask me about that, it's like, okay, how are you managing your middles and what do you need to accomplish out of it before I'd start, you know, just throwing, throwing out hundred pounds of barley and call it good. Amy, could I, could I follow up with just a couple of other uh, items that related to some of the questions that were asked earlier, if that's all right. The, yes. person, the, the person that asked the question about what recommendations would somebody have for uh, cover crops for taking up salt and everything or dealing with salt. Karen answered that, and I think it was spot on there about cover crops in general are going to, if they're, if they're going to increase infiltration in the soil, that's going to help with the salt leaching issue. So I think that's the main important answer. But underlying that question, there might have been the idea that some cover crops might be so called bioaccumulators of certain salts. I don't think that for my understanding of physiology and everything, I, I don't think that's too likely of, a, of, a, of an occurrence there. I don't know if that, in, in any major volumes of salinity, we're not gonna expect plants to accumulate lots of salt there. I don't think that's in general likelihood. The second point I just like to make, and this is a personal opinion, I guess, here at this point, but those of you who are in the Northern region of the Valley right now on the, the webinar this morning, I was in Davis on Monday when the rain started and I couldn't help but notice within an hour or two the utter ponding that was a happening in many, many open area uh, landscapes. And, and those of you who have gone through the last three or four days know what I'm talking about. And you've probably seen it, it, it worsened over time there. Way back in 1938, somebody uh, in the, the former Soil Conservation Service in California made the observation in, in printed form that we, what we need to do is make every drop of rainfall captured where it comes, where it, where it lies or where it, where it is there. And you know that, that I couldn't help but just think about that uh, during this, this current week there and cover crops have a decided role in being able to do that and reducing the surface crusting, the ponding, and eventually the loss of water from the landscape. And you know, if we could make every drop enter where it comes, uh, we'd be doing a great deal of, of conservation and resource use efficiency, I think. 
Those are excellent points, Jeff. Um, I, I'd like to touch on this question, you know, to kind of move on to this. Um, it says, are there examples of farmers who have planted cover crops on fallowed land? If so, what was the result? Amy, I saw that one. I wonder if you could prompt the person who asked the question, the result with regard to what? So if the attendee wants to kind of allude to that, what, what result of what, if you want to type it into the Q&A, that would be great. While they're working that way, I will share that I was working with a grower up near Chico who had done a whole orchard recycling project or was going to, and his intent was to follow that with a cover crop. And so he and I brainstormed what would be a good um, species or species mix for that purpose. And the intent for him was to add some highly lyophile, like really ready to eat for those microbes, carbon um, into the system and help build sort of um, stable organic matter by combining essentially the cover crop and its effect with all of those big wood chips that were just incorporated following the orchard incorporation, the chip and incorporate through the whole orchard recycling project. So I, I, it certainly is something that people have done. And in general, you end up with ground more prepared for whatever's going to come next. And as we all deal with water shortages, our agency has been talking a lot about how do we help people step away from ground if that has to happen in a way that leaves it protected um, and functioning in all those roles that the soil provides us, whether or not it's in crop production. And, and I would and I would point out that cover, putting a cover crop on fallow ground is is going to protect that soil. It's going to help the soil. At least it's going to keep that soil in place because the erosion control is is one of the major things you get out of it. And you know there some would say, well, it's going to harbor this or harbor that. It's like okay, well, let it grow up next big and kill it off and just leave that dry armor on the soil. But I'm, I'm with Karen, it's like, I, I encourage people that, you know, you took out that orchard and you chipped it all up and we found out that, yeah, you're going to need more nitrogen than anticipated to get those trees established when you stick them back in the ground. But, you know, put a cover crop out there for the winter. Sure. And then, you know, okay, well, I got to do this and I got to do that. It's like, well, it's, it's there. You can drive on it. It's a tool. You know, it's not going to be six feet tall in February. So when you want to start working on on it out there and all that fun stuff it's it's kind of land stewardship in my opinion and, and i would love to see a lot more people do that you know put protection on that soil keep it keep it there that way you don't have a giant puddle out there you've got something that's that's growing at the same time it's you know doing greenhouse gas exchange and everything else because you have growing plants there um asphalt doesn't do that bare soil doesn't do that very well So I think, Karen, um, that answered the question in the Q&A, did the cover crop help with improving the quality of the soil? That was what the, the result, that was kind of what the question was alluding to. Um, so I believe that question is answered from Tom. Yeah, I mean, you're going to, putting something, growing something out there is better than not growing something out there. So yeah, you're going to at least maintain what soil quality you might have had before it went fallow. And if not, you're going to improve it. Yeah, and I'll throw on top of that, Brent Holtz has looked at um, following a whole orchard recycling project. I think he had beans out there, and I don't remember what kind. But initially, they struggled a little bit, um, but then they perked up. And so one of the things that I often, it's, just, it's the spider web thing, right? Like you poke a spider web, everything shakes. And so it's really important to be casting your shadow and paying attention, but also decide, you know, 
what can you risk, right? Um, and a lot of times things sort themselves out. A natural system with a good actively cycling carbon source in general will tend towards sorting itself out better than a system without good diverse active microbial and biology going on in it and the cover crops help that so there's another question that was um, asked and actually there was a question that was asked earlier by the same attendee so i'll kind of um, go over both questions so um, is there an increase in land valuation by doing cover cropping and also would you plant the almond trees at the same time as a cover crop on a fallowed piece of land And, and I believe as Silas or someone else mentioned, yeah, plant them both at the same time. You can work through that cover crop if you have to. Um, it's there. As to increasing the valuation of the ground, I'm not sure on our California land values if, if an occasional cover crop is going to make much of a difference on how valuable that ground is. What I would really like to see um, on a lot of ground, a lot of open ground annual crops is leased ground, is that something in that lease clause includes hey when you leave you leave it in in as good a shape or better than you got it which means when you take down your cash crop put a cover crop in and then you know walk away uh there's some movement of that back in the midwest but not so much out here that i know of what i have seen tom is that some landowners have it in the lease that you must cover crop um and or so it may or may not lead to a price premium or a um a, um a, a land value change but for growers who lease ground it may lead to access to good ground thank you for answering those questions i see there was another question earlier that i'm not sure was answered maybe it has been but uh, the question is, can you achieve more solar reflectivity into the crop canopy by cover cropping and no-till? Will this affect crop maturity? Um, I can answer this anecdotally. Um, that is something that we have done with a lot of our pistachio ground is we do have um, some pretty high reflective uh, like wheat straws, different straws. Once dead left on the ground, there is a tremendous amount of reflectivity. Um, does it change and can I compare it to the side of the field where we didn't do that um, and see a result? Yeah, there's some. Um, it does help keep the soil cooler. We did it mainly for the benefit of just reducing soil temperatures and improving um, just the water use efficiency in that. But we also did see a growth response. Whether that growth response was for better water use efficiency or improved solar reflectivity, that's a great question. But I know when we are covering the soil, we're improving the whole system just from that aspect. Thank you, Silas. Let's see here. We have a few comments. I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, so one comment said, I want to point out one specific aspect. Uh, some research I have done with others revealed that cover cropping um, alters the difference between crop temperature and air temperature relative to bare ground. And another comment, uh, rainfall impact will be significantly lower in a fallow field when planted cover crops. It is obvious to keep the soil habitats better in cover crops field during winter. Let's see, I think we have some more answers coming through or questions. Um, okay, let's see here. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. Um, I'll give a minute in case somebody's chatting. Uh, but otherwise, I I could kind of finish off here if there's no additional questions. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our presenters today. Uh, we couldn't have had a success, successful workshop without your research and presentations that were prepared for today. Uh, we will have this workshop recording available on our website, which is uh, www.maderachowchillarcd.org. 
And if you would like a link to the recording, please reach out to um, either Rainey, who sent out the email, or myself at amy at maderachowchillarcd.org. And I will also put my email in the chat for your reference. We will be sending out an email to receive your CCA or DPR credits, and a quiz will be going out to the attendees who will be receiving their DPR credits for their attendance. Uh, we thank you again for attending today, and we will keep you all on our list for our upcoming workshops. Uh, we hope you have a great afternoon. And if there are any additional questions that come up, please feel free to reach out to me by email, and I will reach out to the presenters to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, Amy, I have the chat saved. So if we want to pull off any of the uh, resources that were clicked there, um, maybe we can send that over to Rainy to go through and edit. Um, is she is she doing the preparing the video to uh, to post or are you? Um, I will. So if you want to send me the recording, I could get that. Okay, so I'll send you the record. I'll uh, create a Google Drive to send you the recording and the chat log. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you, Trina. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.